Um, so I will hereby um, open the uh, planning board meeting for uh, December 21st. It is currently 7 p.m. This is Gary Trenzel, the chair of the planning board. Um, as a preliminary matter, uh, permit me to confirm all members and persons anticipated on the agenda are present and can hear me. Uh, members, when I call your name, please respond in the affirmative. Um, Rob Benson. I uh, don't see Rob yet. Uh, Miro Rob is Pan just joining now. Okay, thank you. Um, you know, John, is there an issue with me going in the opposite order here and doing roll call at the end of the statement? Nope. Okay. All right, well, good evening. This open meeting of the Huffington Planning Board is being conducted remotely consistent with Governor Baker's executive order of March 12, 2020 due to the current state of emergency in the Commonwealth due to the outbreak of the COVID-19 virus. In order to mitigate the transmission of the COVID-19 virus, we are complying with the executive order that suspends the requirement of the open meeting law to have all open meetings in a publicly accessible physical location. All members of public bodies are allowed and encouraged to participate remotely. The executive order, which you can find posted with agenda materials for this meeting, allows public bodies to meet entirely remotely as long as the public body makes provisions through adequate alternative means to ensure interest of members of the public who provided reasonable access to the, to the deliberations of the meeting. Ensuring public access does not ensure public participation unless such participation is required by law. This meeting will feature public comments and will further include several public hearings. For this meeting, the planning board is convening by video conference via Zoom app as posted on the town's web meeting calendar and the board's agenda identifying how the public may join in. Additionally, the meeting is being broadcast by HCAM through uh, multiple channels and platforms. Please note this meeting is being recorded and that some attendees are participating by video conference. Accordingly, please be aware that others may be able to see you and take care not to screen share your computer. Anything that you broadcast may be captured by the recording. All supporting materials that have been provided to members of this body are available on the town's website via the web meeting calendar, unless otherwise noted. The public is encouraged to follow along using the posted agenda unless I note otherwise. Uh, before we turn to the first agenda item, permit me to cover some ground rules. Number one, I will introduce each speaker on the agenda. After they conclude their remarks, the chair will invite board members to provide any comments, questions, or motions. Please hold until your name is called. Um, for any response, please wait until the chair yields the floor to, st and, uh, to you and state your name before speaking. If members wish to engage in dialogue with other members, please do so through the chair taking care to identify yourself. Uh, for items, not every agenda item will feature public comments. For items with public comments, after members have spoken, the chair um, will uh, the, chill, the chair will allow for public comment. Um, all participants should use the raise your hand feature in Zoom. Uh, then wait to be acknowledged by the chair. If you can't find the Zoom, uh, raise your hand feature. Just wave your hands furiously and we will probably see you. Um, all participants must begin by stating their name and address. And we ask that participants must limit their comments to three minutes or less. Finally, each vote taken in this meeting will be conducted by roll call. So um, uh, we will quickly uh, confirm who is here. So members, when I call your name, please respond in the affirmative. Uh, Rob? I'm here. Rob Benson is here. Uh, Muriel is not. Um, Jane? You're muted, Jane. You're still muted, Jane. You just give a thumbs up, right? You give us a thumbs up? All right. Good enough for now, and we'll work through it. There we go. Hi, Jane. Uh, Dave? Dave Paul here. Mary? Mary Larson Marlowe here. Deb? Deborah Feinberg here. Sundar? Sundar present. Fran? Fran Dion present. All right. And uh, staff, when I call your name, please respond in the affirmative. Mr. Gilsich? John Gilsich present. Ms. Pemberton? Stephanie Pemberton present. And Mr. Paradise? Bill Paradis, Beta, present. All right, and we'll get to the actual speakers um, as we come up to them. Um, so let's see, before we begin, um, I just wanted to take a moment to acknowledge uh, a couple of quick things. And uh, 
you know, first and foremost, this is our last meeting of 2020, and uh, I'm sure that I can, uh, everyone feels the same, that we will be glad to put this year behind us. Um, but I also just want to point out, I, I think that, you know, with every dark cloud, there, there are some silver linings, and just wanted to, to call out a couple of those. Um, so first and foremost, I just want to publicly acknowledge uh, Muriel is not here tonight because um, she has a new granddaughter that has just joined her family named Holly, which I think is a very appropriate name for a December baby. So um, congrats to Muriel and family. Um, you know, I was thinking about this and I, I think uh, secondly, uh, we've probably all gotten a lot closer to our families, whether we like it or not, because <laughs> um, uh, things have been canceled and postponed. And uh, at the same time, we've all spent a lot more time at home than we have. Um, I think we've all learned to engage in ways that we haven't previously. And um, I think those of us with kids in school, while it's certainly been a hard learning environment, I think that the kind of new way of doing things, I think is likely um, they're gonna deal with again in the future. And I think that uh, for all of us, it's, it's a testament to this group, to how we've been able to continue to function in a really, really trying uh, time and year and continue our obligations um, as planning board members. And, and lastly, as a board, I, I really feel like we've kind of um, found our, our groove. Um, and I think that, you know, I, I just wanted to say that I'm, I'm grateful to all of you. Um, you know, just for, for your engagement, for your passion. And I love the fact that we all kind of have our different topics that we dig into and latch onto and advocate for. Um, and, and last but not least for, for perseverance. And again, it, it's been a hard year. Um, I think all of us have had a lot of challenges, um, some more than others. Um, and yet again, as a board, I think we've continue to function. And I, I think that we've actually raised the, the bar in, in how we function. So just wanted to take a quick moment and, and, and say thank you um, to our board members and, and also to our staff, um, John and Stephanie, because it, we wouldn't be here without them. So, um, you know, um, and very, very grateful for your work and your leadership and your support um, as we've kind of navigated these, these uh, new waters. So um, on that note, um, just quickly on the agenda, um, we have a few administrative items to take care of, and we'll get into those in a few moments, in, in a few minutes. Um, and then we really have uh, three public hearings tonight. Um, Hayden Rowe, we uh, cleared that out um, on Wednesday. So that uh, should help us out a little bit on the schedule, um, but we've got, Continued here at public hearing for Deer Ridge Estates, Lincoln Street and Cedar Street Extension. Uh, we have uh, approximately an hour uh, for that update. Uh, we will continue the public hearing for um, Zero South Street of which we have the site walk on Saturday. Um, we have uh, about 30 minutes for that. Um, and then we have a new public hearing for a minor site plan review, uh, 146 Main Street. Um, and uh, that is for a uh, solar project accessory use uh, over the, the parking lot um, to the back of the building. Um, so while we're talking to formalities, before we get to the administrative items, um, I will entertain a motion to open the public hearings for Deer Ridge Estates, uh, for Zero South Street, and for 146 East Main Street. And this Rob is so moved. Oh, Rob, second. second. Sundar with the motion and Rob with the second. Um, hearing no discussion, we will uh, vote on opening these hearings. Uh, Rob? Rob Benson, yes. Jane? Jane Moran, yes. Dave? Dave Paul, yes. Mary? Mary Larson Marlowe, yes. Deb? Deb Feinberg, yes. Sundar? So this is Raman, yes. Fran? Fran Dion, yes. And Gary Trendles, yes. <laughs> Um, and actually, so uh, we just opened that. Now we're going to move the administrative items, but um, I, I don't know if that made sense or not. But um, for the chair, just a yes. quick process question, suggestion. Sure. Can you elect somebody to, um, uh, two people to um, supply the motion and second it? So I think that would be helpful. We've done that in the past. Just have the same two people for all. Sure. 
Um, well, I will. Uh, I would nominate uh, Rob uh, as the vice chair to uh, make the motions. And uh, Sudar, I appreciate your enthusiasm. So if you're you're willing to um, second them, uh, as long as you are in agreement, then that would be great. Thank you, Mr. Chair. All right. Um, so administrative items. Um, the first one on the list is uh, Wilson Street Solar Decommissioning Bond Estimate. So um, hopefully you all recall that in many cases, um, when we issue a special permit and for solar, we ask them to put forth a bond um, for when the time comes to decommission and deinstall the site. And uh, we've asked them to come back to us with that estimate to determine the appropriate amount. Um, and um, that is what the applicant is here to do today. So do we have the applicant on the phone or on the line? Yes, here. Hi, uh, Hi. Mr. Hafez, did I say that right? That, that's correct. My name is Ahmed Hafez. I'm from Grasshopper Energy. Okay. Um, so really quickly, just, just want to... Um, uh, summarize your um, bond estimate. Um, Sorry, for Gary. The yes. It's TJA Solar. That's the Wilson Street. Grasshopper um, is for the minor site. No, no, no. That's uh, that's not true. Oh no. no. Okay. So, Plankton, so, Plankton Energy is for the minor. Grasshopper okay. has purchased the uh, rights of the solar for. Okay. From Thank Thank you. Lots of solar. That's that's good. That's a good testament for Hopkinton, I guess. Okay. <laughs> uh, so, Mr. Hafez, do you just want to um, quickly? And, and John has kindly put this up on the screen. Um, and uh, I think, in the, the interest of, of being quick, if you could just quickly walk through the the primary items you have here, um, and then at that point, I'll um, ask our town planner, Mr. Gelsich, and our town engineer to quickly respond, and then we can um, take any any questions or comments from the board. Yeah. So good evening, everyone, and thank you for the opportunity to present this to you. And uh, I'm not sure if uh, all the members have had an opportunity to uh, look at this or to see it before this meeting. But uh, th this estimate in, in uh, like high level here, it, it, uh, it lists some uh, like line items for the cost of decommissioning the site after 20 years and to return the, uh, restore the site to its original uh, state and which means like repair any uh, rots of, in the vegetation or any damage to the site during the, uh, the decommissioning. We also, so the, 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 the items are in front of you, you here on the screen, but we've also had here like a salvage uh, material cost or like uh, revenue. And uh, Mr. John has asked us to take it off, take it out of the, our calculations. Although I wanted to speak about this a little bit because the, uh, like for example, the modules themselves, we have a warranty for 30 years for the modules. And here this, this estimate is for the modules to be uh, uh, dismantled after 20 years, which means that the modules will have 10 more years in them guaranteed or warranted. The other thing is there is a lot of steel and copper and aluminum in the, uh, in the site, like incorporating the materials which has a, a significant value. So honestly speaking like this estimate here is very conservative. In some cases, uh, in other projects, we've seen that we, like, we don't pay anything. It's, it's the other way around is that it, there is like an auction for contractors to come and decommission the site and keep the material for themselves. So, and, and so I'm, I'm here to, answer any questions you have about this estimate. Uh, and I'll leave the, uh, give back the floor to you. Thank you, Mr. Hafez. Um, no John, do you have any comments on this? And Mr. Hafez has already alluded to one of those, which I think resulted in a change from the first version of this that I saw. 
Yes. Yeah, so this is the revised one. We got this Friday afternoon. So I apologize. Uh, it was late getting into the shared folder. Um, but they addressed some of the comments from Beta. That was actually Beta's comment about the salvage. So they removed that. The other comment that Beta had was they needed to provide prevailing wages. I'm going to defer to Phil on this one because uh, I think prevailing wages change every so often. So um, how they can incorporate that best is going to be something hopefully he can advise us on. Okay. Thanks, John. Uh, Mr. Paradis? Uh, yes. Yeah. So um, as you know, all all bonds that uh, are come before the town have to be uh, suitable for public bid. Um, and that's why we need um, these estimates to be to include uh, prevailing wages, which is required for a public bids process. So, um, so uh, obviously, I think I think if we can determine a, a date, cert, you know, a date uh, where these will start, I think the you have a um, um, escalation. What what is that? A, um, inflation cost. In inflation. Inflation cost uh, associated with them. So, I think at, at a minimum they need to start at uh, the current uh, prevailing wage for the different. Uh, laborers and equipment. So, okay, um, Mr. Hafez, do you want to respond to that request from our town engineer? Yeah, we we estimated the the, the wages that that we are actually using now on our sites. Like these are skilled labor; they're not the mm -hmm. the minimum wage laborers, and and it's not the very high skilled laborers, given that the work that is done is not like the installation but we considered it as as skilled as skilled of a job as for requires for the installation but we can get uh like it, when you say prevailing wages we can um get you uh, a form where it proves that these are like we can find a form to, to prove to you that these are the prevailing wages and same with the with the equipment as well, this again is a very conservative uh, cost for heavy equipment, whether it's an excavator or uh, like a smaller equipment, it's a thousand dollars a day is uh, is very conservative. Like it's, it's, a, it's a, we pay a lot less than that. But again, we can give you a proof for that cost in, uh, in any form that you would like to see. So, sorry. I'm I realize we're going back and forth a little bit on this, but Mr. Paradis, would, would you agree that these wages here are uh, in line with prevailing wages? No, no. Uh, a laborer is uh, total cost is about sixty dollars an hour, and a and a machine operator is probably about ninety five dollars an hour. So, total cost. Okay. So, so um, Mr. Havez, I, I, I if, if anybody on the board feels otherwise. Um, please feel free to speak up, but I think first and foremost, we'd like to update these, this uh, estimate with the prevailing, the actual prevailing wedge, wages that, um, that Beta uh, is, is referencing. So Mr. Chair, if I, I yes. could uh, ask the applicant a question, it looks like they've got the rate per labor at $200 per day. And then that comes out to with the eight laborers at $200 per day at 20 days, $32,000, correct? Correct. That would be a today cost. And then they correct. factored in the 2% inflation and it's in the last paragraph Correct. during a 20 year lifespan. So the actual, the actual decommissioning amount is not the $99,250. That's the today decommissioning amount. That's correct. 147,480 would be the actual in the future decommissioning bond amount. That's correct, yes. So I believe they are, as the applicant is saying, conservatively estimating the wage rates and then taking the inflation out to the 20 year point. Uh, okay. Through the, through the chair, can I, can I jump in here for a minute? Sure, Rob. So the issue is if there's, right now this, this uh, kind of rate table has $25 an hour per, laborer if they work in eight hour days a laborer is 65 prevailing wage is a government standard rate for a laborer which is about 65 dollars that's so the basis the starting point is wrong uh, 
Okay, I I, yeah. I take I take your point here, and I'll uh, I'll get back to you on that. Uh, but uh, can, may I ask why the salvage uh, salvage material uh, revenue or cost was was taken out, Mr. Paradis? So yeah, it's it's not it's not possible to uh, determine the salvage value of something twenty years from now. Uh, the markets go up and down, and we have no way of, of, of ascertaining what, what that value will be 20 years from now. So. But would, would you, uh, I, I, uh, I agree with you, and it's very hard to estimate. This is why we, we, like, uh, we don't put uh, a number on it, but would you agree that it could close the gap between the prevailing wages or any other number and, and what you see here? Because it's, it will be uh, in excess of, of like hundreds of thousands of dollars in, in steel and copper and aluminum in, in addition to the modules. So a, a, a salvage value may help cover the costs of, of engineering and bid documents to put, put out the bid. So again, I don't think it's, um, you know, there, there are other costs that go into putting out a public bid and that may be something that could cover that. All right, and you know, I, I think, like most situations, um, you know, as a chair, I'm, I'm inclined to follow the, the guidance and lead of our of our town consulting engineer. Um, I realize that that very well might make this a, a bigger bond than maybe what you were hoping for, um, but at the same point. You know, I, I think the intent of the bond is to protect the town. Uh, in case um, you know the town has to actually go in and remove um, all of this equipment, and so you know, to me, the the uh, the town would need to use prevailing wage. Um, that's what we would need to pay. Um, the scrap value, uh, something hard to estimate. So to to me, and again, if if board members feel otherwise, um, to me, it makes sense to update the estimate for prevailing wage. Uh, as has been requested by, uh, or has been recommended um, by our town consultant. For you, so, Mr. Chair. Yes, Dave. I just happened to have some handy notes on solar on my phone, and I, I know that in 2017, Lumber Street, the decommissioned cost was uh, 217000 estimate, and for um, East Main Street, it was 200000 So both of those were over 200000 total. Okay. May I ask what was, uh, Mr. Paul, what was the uh, size of these products? I think they were both the max, which is what, uh, five megawatts or something? Um, th this is 2.4, so this is half the size. Okay, solid point, thank you. So, Mr. Chair, if I could just jump in, I, I think there's still some confusion. I think the prevailing wages are being covered here. Um, there, so if the prevailing wages are $25 or $65 an hour, whatever it is, they're estimating $200 a day, uh, if that makes sense. No. So I guess maybe at that point, they're not covering, they're using two different rates. Mm -hmm. So um, we need them to up to, just to make sure everyone's on the same page. They're doing a rate per day and the board is looking for them to have a rate per hour and then a number of hours. Well, or you could update the prevailing wage to a rate per day, which would be that $60 times eight. Right, and that would have to just be broken down to one other level. One or the other, yes. Right. Is the applicant, applicant clear on that? Yeah, yeah, we're okay. Okay, so John, is this, I mean, I, it sounds like they should come back with this or is there some way to condition this so that the applicant doesn't need to come back and effectively have them, you know, could we condition this in some way? Uh, I guess actually, well, is there some way that we can kind of uh, ensure there's alignment between beta and the applicant um, and move this forward? Or is this something that you'd recommend we bring back at a, at a future hearing? Um, I think since if the board is comfortable with the rest of this estimate, um, and the only issue is the the prevailing wage calculation. I mean, I don't see why the board couldn't condition the approval of this decommissioning bond on the sign off from beta. 
It's not a, it's not a, a you know, permit decision. It's the satisfaction of a, of a decision yeah. uh, condition. Okay. Thank you, John. Through the um, chair? Mary, go ahead, Mary. Hi. Um, two things. One is just that the uh, total written in the text above the table does not match the total that's written in the table. So that should be corrected. Um, and um, the other thing is that um, I, I don't know that this is entirely what we um, talked about in terms of re-landscaping. So it's not just seeding it over, but doing some additional plantings. And I just wanna make sure that that's clear. And I think we might have to go back to the conditions that were approved for the solar project, just to make sure that um, it, this does not imply that it's less than that. Um, Revegetation of the site as necessary to minimize erosion and runoff. It's not just that, it was, it was revegetation of the site. Period. You know, it was. Uh, yeah. Um, so yeah. So Mary, the only thing I would add to that though is the last line: landscaping consistent with the character of the site and neighborhood um, may remain. So maybe there's a way to strengthen that a little bit. Yeah, it's just I don't want it to to seem like that this document supersedes the previous conditions that were um, provided um, upon approval. Because also the, say, the statement that the character of the site and neighborhood may remain suggests that they're not doing anything to it. It's just remaining the way it was. And well, that's not true because you know, there will, will have been clear cut and then they should be doing restoration um, of that site to make it match the character of the surrounding area. So, Mr. Javez, I'm, I'm wondering if there's a way just to keep this clean, if we can reword item C there, um, just to acknowledge um, our previous conditions that uh, can I go back and look and see what the specific condition reads, but just to strengthen it a little bit that. Okay, just to, to respond here to that point, uh, we are also providing a landscaping security uh, for another uh, condition. So that should cover the, the, the landscaping uh, question here, if there is anything. Uh, well, but, but I think this is about landscaping um, when, it's, when the site is removed, not the landscaping and the screen okay. that's provided and around the site. Yeah. And, and I think what, what- And I'm not necessarily implying that the, uh, the amount of the dollars needs to change. I just don't want this wording. The wording to um, imply that it's just, you know, we're just doing some reseeding to minimize erosion. You know, it's not that, it's, it's restoring some of that um, uh, lost vegetation, in, um, including grasses, but also, you know, some bushes and trees, so. So, so maybe just for simplicity's sake, uh, we can modify the last sentence there to say, uh, restored landscape uh, shall be consistent um, with the, uh, with the uh, special permit uh, approval. John has a probably better suggestion so, than mine. Before we get too far afield on this one, I just want to read the actual conditions that they're going off of. So this, uh, the, the decommissioning estimate is condition 10. It says prior to the commencement of construction, the applicant shall submit a detailed estimate of the cost of removal of the installation and to complete all the obligations contained in condition 12 for review by the board's engineer. Um, then they have to come before the board. Condition 12 says, if the director of municipal inspections determines pursuant to section 210204 of the zoning bylaw that the commercial solar photovoltaic installation has been discontinued, the owner shall remove the installation, including all structures, equipment, security barriers, and transmission lines and stabilize or revegetate the site as necessary to minimize erosion and sedimentation at the owner's expense within three months of receipt of a notice of discontinuance. So in the condition, it doesn't necessarily say anything about additional plantings. That may, another, that may be another condition further in the decision, but that's not the decommissioning condition. Okay. okay. So I, hopefully I think we're, we, well, I don't know, any other questions or comments? Uh, that I, I, I'm hoping that we can 
effectively approve this with a condition to update the the wage rates to prevailing uh, prevailing rates. But is there any other questions or comments from the board? This is Dave. Should we just get confirmation that the the, the dollar amount in the verbiage should be ninety nine? I think it is ninety nine thousand. Uh, yes. Yeah, Mr. Havez, can you just and I, so two things to change on this. One is just to update all of the totals to be ninety nine two fifty, not the eighty nine two fifty. Okay. Uh, and then secondly would be well. <laughs> To be honest, that's going to change anyways because the prevailing uh, rate is going to change what that total is. So right, right. I think at the end of the day, I guess what, what I'm going to suggest, and I'll entertain a motion to um, accept this decommissioning plan for 17 Wilson Street Solar Project um, with uh, um, you know conditional upon uh, beta reviewing and approving the um, the removal cost estimate um, to be uh, consistent with uh, prevailing wages. I'll make that motion. Fran, you're breaking the rules. Oh, Fran. <laughs> Rob makes the motions. Rob, Rob, Rob seconds back. them. <laughs> so this is Rob and seconded. See how, see how well this is working? <laughs> Uh, is there any further discussion? Fran, go ahead. Discussion point, Mr. Chairman. So, uh, you know, I'm comfortable with the motion as to <laughs> assuming that uh, Beta uh, is okay with it and John. Uh, Dave, I appreciate you providing the context of the other solar projects and understanding now this is essentially half. Um, so that justifies, I think, a little bit in my mind, right? This is a bit of a swag. Mm -hmm. 20 years out is a long time. But I think given the, the framework and the parameters that we've put forward, uh, again, as, as long as beta is okay with how we kind of laid it out, I'm, I'm comfortable going forward. All right, no further discussion. We will uh, take a vote. So uh, Rob? Rob Benson, yes. Was it seconded yeah. through the chair? Yes, it was. Okay, great. Uh, Jane? Jane Marin, yes. Dave? Dave Paul, yes. Mary? Sorry, Mary Larson Marlowe, yes. Deb? Deb Feinberg, yes. Sundar? Sundar Subraman, yes. Fran? Fran Young, yes. And Gary Trendles, yes. So, uh, thank you, Mr. Havez. And um, we'll just allow you to go ahead and work with, uh, with John and Phil to update that. And uh, appreciate your time tonight. Thank you. And thank you all for your uh, time. And have a good evening, everyone. Thank you very much. All right. Uh, next admin item is uh, Hopkinton Highlands 3 bond release. And is our applicant here? Uh, it would be Marcel Mayet. I don't know if he's here. I haven't heard back from once we sent him Beta's review, so I don't know if he is here. Okay. Well, um, I don't think he needs to be here, does he? Uh, there are still some outstanding items, so yeah. the response from him would be appreciated, but we can always follow up offline with him and then have him come up to another meeting once it's all complete. Yeah, so I guess I'm wondering, just in the interest of efficiency, since there are outstanding items and he would have to agree with those, um, maybe we curb this one for the time being. Um, and either, in my opinion, either he needs to address those outstanding items and not come to the meeting, or he needs to come to the meeting and um, talk through um, why he doesn't need to meet those requests. Does that seem reasonable to people? I'm seeing nodding heads. Agreed. Yep. Agreed. Okay. To the chair with the caveat that if he does show up later on and, and we can fit him in. Yep. Right. Of course. Yep. Very nice, but Dave. <laughs> okay. Um, and then the minutes, uh, the minutes were, weren't in our administrative packet yesterday when I went through everything and I haven't had a chance to look today. So they were in this morning. Sorry. Okay. So at least I, I, I have not had a chance to review the minutes. Um, so I'm going to recommend we postpone I voting that as well. Sorry. Fine from my perspective. <laughs> okay. Um, okay. 
So let's go ahead and turn to the first hearing this evening, Deer Ridge Estates. And of course, uh, our Mr. Benson has been chairing this hearing. So um, at this point, I will turn it over to him to take us through the next steps on this hearing. All right, thanks, Gary. Uh, let me just uh, start off by giving a, a two minute or two second uh, refresh, and then I'm going to pass it to the applicant. And I think uh, Shane, on behalf of the applicant, wants to give some opening remarks. But uh, as you all know, we've had we've discussed this at several uh, several planning board meetings. This is the open space subdivision uh, special permit um, for the development between Cedar Street Extension and Lincoln Street. So um, at our last meeting, we had a vote to waive the 100-foot buffer. We came to a four to four uh, tie in the vote. So it didn't pass because you need a majority vote to pass. So the applicant went back to the drawing board. And uh, that's where I want to kick it over to um, Shane. If you want to give some opening remarks, I think that would be appropriate and uh, where we are now. Yes. Yeah. Thank you, um, John. Is there any way to share the new screen, uh, the new plan on the screen? All right. You should try it now. And just for the board's benefit, uh, Shane, you can introduce yourself, but you're Courtney's business partner, correct? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So, so my name is Shane Peralt. Uh, I'm Courtney Kyle's, you know, lifelong friend, business partner. Uh, I own Kenco Development. We're a full service general contractor. We're going to be handling the, you know, engineering development and, you know, budget for the project. Um, I was planning on getting more involved in the definitive stage, uh, but given kind of where we're at with this concept phase, I figured I'd introduce myself and offer a helping hand on understanding our development and our goals. Um, and just one of the things I wanted to start off um, with is understanding, you know, how we got to this subdivision plan. Uh, it's very important to me that we revisit this. Uh, you know, when I first reviewed the project with Courtney earlier in the year, uh, like any developer, you know, to me it was a no-brainer to to go with a through road uh, at the property. You know, without open space concept, uh, you know, we'd be able to get more or larger lots. And you know, with a straight road, it's it's cheaper cost to construct. Um, so that's how the idea came up in the you know, beginning meetings that we had and why you guys have a copy of that plan on file. Um, but, uh, you know, from the start, you know, Cordy was, was adamant that it was, it was, a, you know, was against the, the through road, uh, you know, being a member of the community, she, uh, you know, had a lot of communication and extensive involvement, you know, with the neighbors and her intentions for the development was to do was in the you know, best interest of the neighbors, including herself. You know, so that's why our application is, for the dual call the sacks that you see. Um, Courtney had, uh, you know, multiple meetings with every abutter and, you know, they're all well aware of the design. They're all, if, um, you know, multiple times have seen the plans and, and, and any effects that it has on the property. And one of our goals, you know, from the beginning was to fully be transparent with the neighbors. And, you know, we, we've discussed many options with the Pappas family, including, you know, their well issues and screening and, you know, planting of trees. Um, wire mesh fencing. Um, we also had a lot of coordination with, uh, you know, the Franzas and landscape improvements and plantings. And we did an engineer analysis uh, for Supraya to, you know, ensure that headlights won't shine into our, to our house. And, you know, we had a lot of meetings with the, the fire chief too, uh, to talk about safety, uh, cisterns and sprinkler systems in the home, because, you know, safety was a big concern of ours as, as is a support, you know, with the neighbors. So, um, you know, that being said, it, it's, it's been about five months since we applied for the permit. You know, we tried our best um, to do what's in the best interest of the community, uh, but we're just continuing to spin our wheels week after week on this concept plan. Um, and for the majority of the meetings in the beginning, we were, uh, you know, trying to find a solution to your concern about the road being more than a thousand feet, you know, only to come to realize after about three months that, you know, uh, for the zoning board of official, we don't even qualify for that. And, um, you know, as long as the road is, that we're extending is less than a thousand feet, which was our plan you know, from the beginning. Um, and given the extensive involvement that Courtney had you know, with the butters and, you know, 
implementing their concerns into our design. You know, we were hoping to have a little bit of latitude with the buffer waiver request, <laughs> but obviously we got voted down, which was a little disappointing, but um, we definitely heard the concerns of the people that, you know, um, voted against it. We think the people that, that supported it, um, uh, we factor this all into the new design and, you know, this hopefully will satisfy, you know, any issues of concern and come, you know, with a positive outcome because basically given the time frame we're at, the resources that we've spent at this point, um, you know, we may have no other option, but to start looking at that through road option, um, you know, given, given where we're at, but we're pretty confident this new plan will work. Um, you know, when looking at this, I, Joe, are you able to pull up the plan? Mr. Marquardon, are you unmuted? Oh, there you are. See ya. So but overall view of this plan when, you know, given the shape of the land, um, it wasn't really feasible to do, uh, you know, one large open space, like we were discussing last meeting, um, you know, and still be able to obtain the number of lots we need to make the project feasible. And that's why we had the two different large portions of land with the balance of the open space, you know, surrounding the properties. Um, I, Gary mentioned, um, you know, the open space land uh, in the last, you know, at the last meeting seemed to be somewhat useless. Um, but, you know, I can argue nothing but the opposite. I, I think some of the board members had trouble, um, you know, understanding the layout along with the you know, entry points of use in the open space. Um, you'll notice that the green area um, that surrounds the open space um, is you know basically was was at request of the abutters um you know to preserve the land that abutted their house and to keep natural and distance um you know from the new lots our main goal was to not have any of the abutters be able to see any of the new homes um the large open space that's planned north by the river um it's about 3.3 acres and it is easily accessible by over 100 feet of frontage on the right side of lincoln street i, I think the board was on the assumption we were going to be getting there from Cedar Ave, which was never the case because that sliver of land has been coordinated with the Papa's family and is essentially going to be used for screening, plantings, fencing, and you know strictly not be any access. Uh, access will be off of Lincoln Street, and then the um, the other plan uh, south open space is about 5.9 acres of land. It consists of rock formations and trails and that again is access off Lincoln Street by over 100 foot of frontage. Um, and we also, uh, anybody from the new road can access Lincoln Street in both of these areas through the fire access road that we put in. Uh, that was basically the main intention. Um, just, you know, we just want to be clear that it wasn't our intention to, you know, give back useless land or, or not, you know, not make this usable. Um, Courtney was very adamant from the beginning that we involve HALT, which we have involved Maury from the beginning, um, and provide a nice usable area for the neighbors, for her, um, and the community. Um, and then for the last change we did, we took the advice of Gary and Fran, and we shrunk the lot sizes, and we pushed the buffers to 100 feet at Plan South and Plan East, um, which is... Uh, allows very minimizes the areas where there's a, a hundred less than a hundred foot setback and also uh, increases the size of the open space um, so we've usually we've basically done our best to create a plan that meets you know the board's recommendations and requirements and especially um, one that has full support of the neighbors and full involvement with the neighbors um, so at this point uh, we're proposing this new plan in hopes that you know you guys can review it and approve and kind of allow us a move forward to the next step of the project. 
Thank you. Uh, Joe, would it be possible to uh, minimize the left-hand navigation and the right-hand navigation just so we get a better view? How about the just, left only? <laughs> just that, that little arrow in the middle of the screen, if you click that little arrow in the, uh, right next to AutoCAD SHX text, that arrow next to it, uh, to the left of it. Go, go down a little bit, I'm that sorry. arrow right there. There you, there you go. I'm sorry, there we go. <laughs> and uh, if you could just zoom in a little bit on the... So do you wanna show them the areas that we increased the buffer? Um, so here along the eastern side, went to 100. Here along the westerly side of the lots, went to 100. This area was 100, and then follows down to meet Sears Street. And this area was increased to 100 feet. With a chair? Yes, Mary, please. Um, I'm curious as to what the discussions with the Papa Spires have been regarding the 10 foot buffer here on the northern, uh, well, I, I don't know what side of the property is, <laughs> what direction it is yeah, we, on the top well, of that plan. Courtney, can, Courtney spoke with them specifically so she can maybe chime in, but um, the Papas are well aware of this plan. Um, this, they had involvement in 2004 with Jose Martins when this plan was approved back in 2004, literally pretty much the same exact layout. Um, so they're well aware of the project. Courtney met with them and you know, explains, showed plans, explained what we're looking at. And obviously they were aware of the 10 foot setback and um, we were very transparent with them that we wanted to um, you know, make sure that they were happy and, and they you know, supported the plan. So we discussed, um, they had issues with their well. We discussed, um, you know, making sure that their well is not impacted. If it is, you know, just basically trying to find a way to you know, drill, drill a deeper well for them or, uh, you know, make corrections as needed. And then we discussed plantings. They threw out some different kinds of plants and trees they'd like to see in there. And then we discussed uh, fencing and through the terrain, they wanted to see a, a farm style wire mesh fence. And um, so we've had some conversations about, you know, making sure that they're, they're happy. And I don't know if Courtney, you want to chime in at all about your conversations with them. I know you met them multiple times. I think you kind of covered it. We've tried to be um, cooperative with them. They've been great to work with. And it's really important to us that they're comfortable with um, any impact this may have on them. I guess the only thing I'd add, and I think you did point it out before, but um, you know, very adamant that that area between them and the property next to them, that 10 foot area is not to be used as any kind of trailhead. Um, we really would prefer nobody walking through that. That's not meant to be access. That should be plantings, uh, privacy, et cetera. And how are you going to ensure that that's not used as access? Um, you're gonna put like a big rock at the entrance to it <laughs> near, you can near Cedar those, Street or in here? Yeah, we can finalize those details at, you know, we'll yeah, that's fine. the definitive that's stage. I know you guys had mentioned, um, you know, obviously we have to take some rock walls apart. We can utilize those at the entry and build a rock wall over there. I mean, there's a lot of different means and methods, but the goal is to have that filled with trees and planting to create additional screening and additional, um, you know, nature for. Okay. for yeah, path. yeah. Ten feet doesn't allow for a lot of a lot of plantings. Pretty much just one row, um, <laughs> you know. But um, has have those discussions, any discussions, additional discussions, taken place? since the last meeting when they were here because they expressed concerns that did not seem to be addressed from their perspective um, at that time. I mean, I understand that you may have spoken to them a while ago, but at least at the last meeting, they did not appear to be completely comfortable with this very small buffer. I would disagree. I, I guess I'd say, you know, if they are on, maybe they need a moment to speak, but um, you know, we, it is an ongoing thing. So we have really open communication with them um, from 
months and months ago. So I think that they see our efforts are there and we're doing our best to make sure we get them everything they need. Uh, without moving forward on our end, it's difficult to ensure anything because nothing's quite happened quite yet. So we have these um, suggestions that they've made to us, a laundry list of items they'd like to see happen. And on our end, um, some guarantees as long as the project does proceed, but um, we're all kind of just waiting to see what happens from here. But, but I, I, would, I, would, I don't want to speak for them, but I, I do believe that they're comfortable that our line of communication is open and that their concerns have not only been made clear to us, but we have made um, efforts to let them know that we take them very seriously and that we understand their priorities and their concerns. All right. So through the chair. Yes, Dave. Um, I just want to call it out to make sure we're all on the same wavelength. So this new plan does not have any kind of um, emergency access between the two cul-de-sacs. Is that correct? Yeah. Yes, it does. Red hash line, but, but labeled fire lane between the two cul-de-sacs. Same as the uh, plan from last. Can you point that out, please. Yep. Does anybody um, zoom in maybe a little bit? wanted to highlight the open space in green so it's a little bit more difficult to see but it's the same location as last time there's a there's a uh, 16 foot wide fire lane from one cul-de-sac to the other <clears throat> oh that's the red dotted line and 60 okay yep that's correct that's correct okay i know there was concern about people on um, the new road off of cedar Ave being able to access these uh you know open spaces oh, and okay that's our sorry I, I wasn't looking down on the bottom I was looking straight across so go down the bottom thank you yep. to, to the chair Rob Fran go ahead yeah uh, the, I I guess I'd like to open it up to all board members to ask questions uh, but yeah Fran go okay so I, I'd first like to uh, acknowledge and you know, express my uh, appreciation for the applicant for kind of hearing the feedback from the last meeting and increasing some of that buffer width in some of the areas that um, you identified earlier this evening. So thank you for that. Uh, and just so I'm clear, the only waiver request from a buffer perspective is off of Cedar Street where it's at 10 feet. Is that correct? That's the only buffer waiver request that you're uh, looking for at this point for other others? Yeah, so this is where I, or only at Cedar Ave Extension. Um, yeah. The abutting neighbors and uh, plan south to Franza. Yeah. Okay. That's good. And so that that's great. So thank you once again. I'm sure we'll have an opportunity to hear from the abutters at some point here during this meeting. But I just want to acknowledge the work that you put in to make those changes. So thank you. I guess I, uh, so I have a question. So uh, the question came up of if you've talked to the Pappas's uh, who are to, to the, <laughs> the upper side of this this uh, picture, um, I'm assuming they, they know the two, two options. Like one option is kind of an open space plan and the other option is a through road where fundamentally the requirements, the zoning bylaws don't require a buffer. And do they know the difference in, in kind of what that would mean to them? I, I'm not sure if you're asking us, but I would I would really feel uncomfortable answering that for them. We've tried our best to educate everybody, but um, I, I don't know what they're how they or what they understand versus what they don't understand uh, with the two concepts. Okay, maybe yeah, I think maybe an unfair question. Through the chair, we've shown both plans yep. to all of the abutters. Um, and as Courtney said, try to get them to understand the, the, the consequences with the two. Um, and every feedback that we got from the abutters was, you know, against the through road and including Courtney. So, um, we, like she said, we've done our best to try to explain the situations here and how this open space concept we feel benefits everybody, you know, that's involved. Uh, yes, Sundar, please. Uh, Rob, when when um, 
in the previous meeting, we had taken a vote and it did not go through. Uh, my understanding at that point was um, uh, certain considerations that have been taken into account by for providing the 100 foot buffer has been of course addressed by uh, Mr. Mr. Perot in, in, this, in this presentation. It was not my understanding that last time around when the vote failed, it failed on the topic of the papuses and the other abutter not having been consulted regarding the 10 foot butter, buffer. I, I, I could be wrong here, but my, my thing is, I just wanna no, make there's, sure that- there's, there's no requirement to consult the abutters. That's okay. What we're, we're, we're asking to try to um, sure, get no, a sense I, I, of I, I, the I just dropped, neighbors. That's my way of saying that I thought we had already passed through that filter and where we got, uh, you know, where the vote failed was essentially uh, the inability of the applicant to provide, you know, larger buffers in other areas, which they seem to have addressed. I, I'm just saying that have we, it, it seems to me that they, we may have crossed through some of those filters, but open to having a discussion, but I just wanted to express my opinion about the the conversation with the abutters at that point. I think it was that um, along with, you know, the access, you know, access to these open spaces, I, I think some of the, the members didn't see areas, you know, where where they could access the, these open spaces. That's why we wanted to clearly point that out in this meeting. I think they assumed that, you know, it was going to be through that 10 foot buffer that was supposed to be screened, which is which is not the case. I have something else um, through the chair. I don't want to. Yes, Mary, please. Other board members that have, but yeah, have, I'm... Has, has anyone addressed, um, uh, you know, whether or not the design of um, where the fire lane, where the connecting fire lane road slash trail <laughs> is whether or not it can be moved. I mean, I don't know if you've had a chance to address that, whether or not it, it's it's possible to to move it at all in this design. Um, I, I don't recall who brought that up last time. Uh, one of the board members who thought it was um, it was obtrusive to the open space. Um, but uh, I wasn't sure whether or not that had been looked at. Mr. Chair, can I, can I comment on that? Yes, Gary. Um, and, and, and I, so my understanding is that um, HALT uh, and in some ways the um, Open Space Committee had some preference um, to not have a 16 foot long or 16 foot wide fire lane going through the open space because they felt that was um, disrupting or you know kind of uh, negatively impacting the the open space. Um, so I, I think that's that's largely where that perspective came from. Um, and so if it's okay, I, I have a, a another um, question or another another, another comment and, and a question. Um, I, I also, just to echo Fran's comments, I also appreciate the applicant hearing our feedback and um, I do acknowledge that I think we were so focused on the Cedar Street extension side that I candidly, I, I missed the access off of Lincoln Street. So I, I um, certainly appreciate the applicant's um, uh, consistency in pointing that out and I think that that access is important. Um, I actually would argue that the fire lane actually provides, uh, I think, while it may sort of um, put a pathway through the open space. Um, my point uh, and to some of the open space members that I've talked to is that, you know, people, different types of people want to access uh, or have a desire to access open space. And one of the good things about a fire lane like this is that um, in particular for people um, that might be, uh, might not be as uh, mobile, um, that sometimes things like this actually give them some connectivity and, and, a, and a place to, to walk or exercise that I think is beneficial. So um, in my opinion, I actually, while I realize that the fire lane goes through the open space, I don't see that as a detriment at all because I think it actually provides access to that open space um, to, to more people. Um, my question is, um, you know, I think in the previous open space calculation, um, the that 10 foot buffer uh, was necessary to meet the open space uh, requirements. And I guess I'm just curious, now that you've 
decrease the lot size? Does it increase the buffer zones elsewhere? I'm wondering if you can just summarize the, the total percentage of the proposal that is open space. Um, and I'm also wondering if you can, you know, if you were to not include that 10 foot wide strip uh, along the Pappas, prop Pappas property, um, if the remaining open space um, would meet the criteria um, for the OSLPD. Um, and then my, my so that's that's my first question. And then my second question, um, when you not when you mentioned the the south the southern lot being I think 5.4 acres, as I look at the northern versus the southern, the northern one actually looks bigger to me. And I guess I'm just curious if you can when you when you mentioned that I think it was 5.4 acres, does that include the buffer uh, zones all the way around that that island? So those were my my two my two questions. Yeah, so Joe, I, I, you can probably speak better for the calculations, but I believe we're at 54% is now open space. Um, I believe the bylaws 50-50. So um, prior, I think we were 51-49. Um, and yes, I believe that that open space includes that parcel of land that goes um, down to Cedar Street extension. That was a, a big item for the DeFranza about our, <clears throat> he was, you know, pretty adamant that that stays, it's very wooded in that area. And he was, you know, when we had our discussions, he was pretty adamant that that stays as is, you know, so that it can provide screening. Obviously we're less than hundred feet in that area. So that was our main goal there. Um, the goal with the 10 feet between Pappas is to try to maintain, you know, the, the natural state that's there and have the control to not have whoever moves into the property, clear the land all the way up to the Pavis's property. That's something that they didn't want. And that's something we're trying to provide here. It's a little bit of buffer space, even though it's not a lot, it's it's something to allow us to control that. Yeah, so if I can respond to that, Mr. Chair, and I, again, I, I, no, I, I get that. Uh, I would agree 10 feet isn't, you know, again, that's narrower than the width of the room I'm in, but I, I guess I just, to me, the spirit of the open space preservation bylaw um, is to protect some of these useful, um, you know, or or you know, kind of larger open spaces uh, to to keep them intact so that they do serve some function, whether it be for wildlife or for recreation or or whatnot. So to me, that that ten foot strip, while might create some additional maybe create some additional screening. Although again, as we've learned through a lot of our hearings, um, you know, hundred feet isn't necessarily a whole lot either, but you know, it's 10 feet. I guess I just, you know, if, if you tell me that without that 10 foot strip that you still meet the open space uh, criteria for the percentage of land that is open space, then, then that makes me feel a whole lot better uh, about this, this project. And it makes it easier for me to consider waiving the, the remaining uh, buffer zone requirements. Joe, is there any way to calculate that? Up that boundary line, it's about 640 feet east-west. So the 10 foot wide would put us at 6,400 square feet. We are not that tight with our numbers. We could certainly uh, absorb that 6,400 and still provide the, the minimum open space. I think it was more of a, to provide, to show some green in between and undevelopable space between the Pappas. Um, if, if, you know, if we need to give that back, we have no issues doing that. It, yeah, it, it, and I'm not saying give that back. I'm just saying, let's just not count that. I, I mean, psychologically, I just don't really, I, I, I get why you're counting it, but I just, um, it, it doesn't really serve the, the purpose to, of, of open space. Yeah, the goal is to work with the Pappas and put in any necessary plantings on their property, uh, install a fence of, of their liking, and then provide you know, a 10 foot buffer. Um, you know, we were trying to give as much as we could without infringing on that lot. The, you mentioned before the lot was already thin, so we couldn't give too much. Our issue is with the shape of the land that it's bottlenecked in that location, so it's difficult to to try to rework those lot sizes. Um, but we were just trying to do the best we could to give some buffer, but also, you know, work with, with the Pappas to, to give them whatever they feel comfortable, you know, to screen themselves from the, from the project. I think I'd, 
I'm, I'm going to give the uh, everybody on the board an opportunity to have kind of a one more one more opportunity to ask questions. But um, is there anyone in the public that would like to speak to this project? If they could use the raise hand feature of Zoom, uh, and so we could. Um, I see Maury Gasser. We'll just go in order of uh, who raises their hand first. So, um, Maury, welcome. Could you give your name and address and uh, go from there? I'm Maury Gasser, 28 South Mill Street, uh, speaking from a halt perspective. Uh, I actually just have one question. Could somebody tell me what the fire lane is going to look like? What's it going to be covered with? Uh, what kind of surface? I, uh, go ahead, Shane. Yeah, we, I mean, these details are, will be ironed out with Joe and I in more in the definitive, um, but there are many different options of road surface uh, we can visit. Obviously, there's your standard gravel. Um, we can do grass pavers. There's a multitude of things we can use depending on, you know, what we want to accomplish for a look. Okay. It's, 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 it's nice to go. We, in some of our other developments, we've done grass pavers to, to keep it green, but um, eventually with the traffic of people, it just goes into mud and dirt and isn't worth it. Um, so we, typically go with a standard gravel road. To the chair, just a comment on that, please. Sure, Dave. Um, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think they need to work closely with the fire department to make sure the fire trucks can handle that, whatever they put down. Yep, we are. And I think in previous neighborhood, it was asphalt, correct? Mm -hmm. And you mean in a, another neighborhood in, in Hopkinton? Correct, so that was the uh, other one that we did. I believe that's that is correct. Yeah, I mean, we could certainly revisit. We could certainly visit that. I don't see why they'd want to add more impervious material um, when it's not really needed. Um, environmentally speaking, just, just one quick comment. We we do have uh, impervious asphalt in some of the sidewalks in town, so that could be an option as well. Although that might not be able to handle a fire truck. So you mean pervious, not pervious? Sorry, pervious. <laughs> yes, thank you. Just just to educate everybody on this call, some of the we can discuss uh, that the type of uh, connecting material in that fire lane now, but it's also going to be rediscussed at a definitive subdivision stage. So um, I just want to kind of procedurally, this is our special permit hearing to see if the project even kind of passes the test of um, can it be built, and then there's going to be a definitive subdivision plan where all of the details will be further ironed out and further agreed upon. That's our intention. Yep. So I just want to educate the everybody on the call uh, that might not be involved in these meetings regularly. Um, Maury, did you have any more questions or I'm going to go to uh, Courtney? No, or you can go to Courtney. Thanks, Courtney. I actually just wanted to let you know, uh, Mr. Byers, who lives at the property that we keep referring to as Papa, is just made a note that his raise hand feature isn't working. So if you can just please call on him to have him have a moment to speak. Um, well, yeah, I, I, may, I see it, it raised here. So I'll go to him next. <laughs> I don't have anything else to say right now. They're on, they're on mute though. Uh, John, you, you have go. to, yeah. There. Uh, thank you um, for um, giving us an opportunity to speak um, and sorry for our tardiness. Um, when we met and discussed the 10 foot buffer, we honestly did not know that the town had a bylaw that specifically in order to have the trails, et cetera, in exchange is a certain number of feet buffer zone. We didn't realize that we had any uh, choice in the matter. We, we just assumed that somebody was gonna eventually uh, build right up against us and that we were going to go for the best shielding and uh, privacy screen that we could get. It was a surprise to us to see that there was 80 feet buffer everywhere except up against our property line. Um, and, and you're absolutely right. We have a strange uh, property line uh, with the Hubleys next door to us. And we realize that the 10 feet there is can't be changed. We understand that. Our bigger concern was behind that, um, where our addition has windows that basically uh, a house will be looking directly into. 
Um, so that was, uh, that was our concern and it was kind of uh, a surprise to us last week when we were looking at it and people saying, oh, that 80 feet isn't even the 100 feet buffer zone. And our question last, last time we, uh, the meeting was, was why is there, uh, is there a way to have more buffer zone on the back end rather than towards the road? Uh, that is going to be the dead end. We're, yeah, we're just trying to balance. We're trying to make everybody happy. We're trying to do this so everybody is, you know, wins in this situation. Um, when going through the design and calculation, the more that we kind of share on both sides of the road, the more it takes away from what Gary keeps referring to as trying to get larger spaces of land. Um, for the 10 feet that it would gain on your end, it would sure kind of sliver down 10 feet on the other end which makes that side pretty unusable for anything more you'd want to do with it. So we're, we're just trying to find an equal balance. Can I respond to that for just a second? Um, last meeting, I understood that that road and the space next to the road wasn't actually very uh, desirable as far as trails. It would be just like walking on a road and that that wasn't what they were most interested in was that end of the property being expanded into trails. So that's when we were like, well, if it's not, if it's not uh, a desirable space for uh, open space, then why can't the road be moved over? Uh, there's plenty of buffer on the other side for the neighbors. Um, it's really the 10 feet just is really, that's extreme. I don't know if any of you would like to have 10 feet uh, when you've had forest for 20 some years. Yeah, we don't, I mean, we haven't shown a planned trail or trailhead. Uh, there are all existing trails all throughout that area that we're assumed to be reused. Um, it looks like a small sliver of land on the plan, but it's actually a good portion of land that, that can be used for, for trails. Um, so we try to preserve that, especially the trails that were existing. Through the chair, could I ask that Joe pull up the plan again? And sure, in. yep. Yeah, awesome. Thank you. The blue hashed lines are the existing trail system. Sorry, to, to support Mary, can you just show exactly which 10 foot buffer we're talking about here? Joe? Right along. Okay. You see where the hand, the cursor is? Um, yeah, so Dave? Yeah, yeah, so, so to the right of that is where that's where she's asking for more buffer. No, it's actually below the hand. So um, it's not not right along the, the road where it's abutting a different property, not owned by this developer, but farther back along the horizontal green stripe, where those two lots are very narrow lots, house lots. And all the buffer is being given to the property to the, the, the lower side rather than any to um, the Pappas um, property. And right. that, that's my main concern is that everybody else's buffer is looking fine, you know, with, with some just, you know, it's minor, minor deviations from the 100 foot rule, but, but the Pappas are basically paying the price for it everybody in this development. That's kind of the way I see it. And I, I do understand the difficulty in getting a narrow, you know, very narrow strip of land on the uh, coming off Cedar Street, being able to develop that and have any lots at all. But, um, you know, that, that's the alternative is, is reducing the house lots or redistributing the house lots and not having um, them, you know, is, uh, both two on one side there um, next to uh, the Pappas. I, th I, um, I think it's worth kind of restating. Uh, Mary, uh, go ahead, Mary. Go ahead. No, I'm just, you know, I'm, I'm speculating. I'm just saying that, you know, 
there has to be a way to make this this work. And I, I know it's hard to keep everybody happy, but I do feel like it's it's being a little one sided right now. That's all. Um, so I I think um, Joe, could you sh do you have the conventional plan readily available? No, I'm sorry, I do not. Um, and John, I know it was in our packet of material. Would it be possible to bring it up? Yeah, let me dig it up. So I, I, I guess I guess my point is I don't know that everybody in the call is aware there's differences between open space um, OSLPD development and plan and a conventional plan. A conventional plan is what John is is um, going to bring up here, which is going to show a through road, and there's no buffer requirements, meaning the 10 feet we're talking about is not going to exist. So I just want everyone to be aware that um, kind of the 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 if if a plan with an open space plan doesn't get um, get approved, the developer would be forced to look at a conventional plan. And if you could kind of zoom in on the, the kind of the that yeah the main area there, like so this shows there's 10 feet buffer between um, the Hubleys and the Pappases, but then the next two lots there would be there'd be no buffer. So that's um, I think it's important to know kind of the difference the different options here is it's not um, it's not like there's an option between 10 feet and automatically guaranteeing 100 feet. It's it. I think there'd be more of a force nature to move towards a plan like this on the developers. I don't want to speak for the developer, but um, that's what they started off with this kind of um, what's in their mind. Yeah. Well, that's where we're at. Um, we've for, for five months, we're, we've gone round and round and, and we're trying our best to make everybody happy and, and, and make it the best plan we can with the cul-de-sac, dual cul-de-sac. I'm going to be completely transparent. Um, doing two cul-de-sacs is very expensive financially. Uh, so in order to even make this project financially feasible, we, per our business plan, we, we're, we need to have eight lots or the project for dual cul-de-sac won't be feasible. Um, the bottlenecked area um, that Mary keeps referring to is, you know, we can shift that road a bit, but, you know, we can't just get, we won't be able to just get rid of a lot um, because if that was the case, then, you know, we won't be able to afford to build the dual cul-de-sac and, you know, that will force us back into the, uh, the through road, which is, you know, what, what I had mentioned in the beginning of the project. So, um, you know, these five months, we've tried our best to, to make everybody that's involved happy in, in coming up with this kind of final proposed plan that I, that we feel is, you know, the best option for everybody involved um, versus the alternative. And, and that's kind of the proposal and where we're at today. Okay, uh, I, I'm i not, I know it's uh, on the meeting list, it's Eric Byers, but I, I know your name's not Eric's, but if you'd like to, to um, like to speak, please. Yes, my name is Ida Pappas. Um, I'm, I think my name is actually on the plans there. Um, so my, my comment earlier actually, uh, it looks like exactly what this, this image is where the, the actual road is pushed towards the other, the other side of the, um, of the property. And so the house doesn't have to sit so far back towards our house. That's what we were asking if, and, and, and you know, us having to choose whether we have a 10 foot buffer or a, a road going through, I, 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 that's to me that was really disingenuous in that everyone else will, will have basically gotten something out of this uh, except for us. And, and to me that was, that was disappointing to hear. Uh, my question had to do with, could you move that property line or the road over in order to give, give us more buffer? And it was, you basically said that it, that wasn't an option because you needed open space. No, no, I, I, I did not say that wasn't an option. I said, the reason we have it designed as is, is we're trying to make the last meeting we had, the board was very concerned about the trail system and maintaining large open spaces. So we have to figure out one way to go, one or the other. And when we did the redesign, we, we want to try to preserve that existing trailhead and keep 
the larger area open. We certainly can shift that down, um, but what that will do is now decrease the size of the open space and actually make two smaller spaces, which um, Gary has expressed multiple times is not ideal. So we're, we're just trying to do our best to make everybody happy when we do one thing, it doesn't make I understand what you're saying. Um, I, uh, from the last meeting, I, I feel very confident that Gary said having open space there was not what he was looking for because it would be as if he were walking on that road. So I don't know if that is what Gary wanted. So I, and maybe I missed something and I apologize if I did. Oh, okay. Th I appreciate the, all the um, dialogue. Is there any questions from the board members? So should we, since there be, seems to be some confusion over Gary's thoughts on that section, can we get some input from him? <laughs> Gary, would you like to uh, add any, uh, any, add any, uh, your opinion? Yeah. So, I mean, from a thematic perspective, you know, I, I this is going to sound bad. I kind of agree with both. Um, but, you know, from a thematic perspective, yes, the goal of open space is to give larger tracts of, of land that in turn increase its, its usefulness. Um, that being said, I've always felt like that 10 foot buffer zone is not really in the spirit of open space. Um, and, you know, again, if there is a way to push the road further over and give some additional buffer, I, I think that's, that's worth doing. Um, so I, I don't know if I necessarily answer that question. Um, you know, it, it, it's hard to sort of, um, hypothesize based on drawings that we don't have. I can kind of imagine it, uh, as to how it might shift over some, but, um, you know, so, so to the chair, if I may. Yes, Paul, uh, Dave. It, it sounds like everybody would be okay with that road going along the bottom. Am I understanding that correctly? Just trying to be a peacemaker here. Although I think Gary wins the award because he said he agreed with both. So he's got a, a, <laughs> a career as a politician. That's embarrassing. I'm sorry. But you no, know, I think you're right, Dave. That I mean, I, you know, I think that we've all not been trying not to design this for them. Just tell them what our concerns are. And, you know, there are concerns that, that, um, that butt up against each other. Um, there's concerns about um, having um, adequate buffer, again, in keeping with an open space land preservation development or open, yeah, whatever that is, <laughs> OSLPD. And, um, having more and the pop us um, uh, property. And um, there's also the concern of having contiguous open space that is accessible to the public. I think, I think um, the, uh, the developers have done a very good job getting accessibility um, uh, via Lincoln Street. And of course, um, you know, by, by um, you know, walking along the new development road that would be accessible from Cedar Street to the open spaces of um, this development. Um, but I really do feel like just the adjustment of having the access road, the cul-de-sac from um, Cedar Street move down toward the other property line a little bit more to adjust the, uh, the location of those houses not not losing a house lot and allowing for a little more buffer um, uh, for the Pappas would would satisfy. You know, yeah, that, that certainly makes sense to me. Yep. Yeah, we don't we don't have any issue with that. Again, we were just trying to you know meet the guidelines and, and, and the recommendations that we were given. Um, I guess the question I have is probably for John. Um, you know we regardless how much we slide that down, we're, we're still not going to meet the 100 foot buffer. Um, and I guess at this point, we're just, we're just trying to get to the next step. Um, so if we revise the plan to show that, is it gonna make a difference um, in the waiver request? Or is that something we can show during the definitive design? Um, 
It's a good question. So basically, I'll, there is a provision in the zoning that sets forth what would require a modification of the special permit. So let me look that up. But basically, it's up to the planning board to grant the waiver. So if the board as a whole says, yes, moving the road down to change the buffer on the south part of the road to increase the north part of the road buffer, that's what they're looking for, then that's up to them to say, yeah, that'll make us grant this waiver. It's not, that's not a regulatory thing. Um, the regulatory thing is that it's gotta be a hundred feet, but the board can grant that waiver. So it would really be a, a negotiation with the board. But um, while you guys continue to discuss, I'll look up the, uh, the limits for modification because I don't quite remember if changing the layout of the road requires a modification of the special permit if it's done in the subdivision phase. So I will look into that right now. Through, through the chair? Yes, Fran. Uh, Rob, well, John's looking that up. Maybe just a question uh, through you, Mr. Chairman, is you know, if we were to make that, or if the applicant were to make that modification of the road or move it a little bit more toward that southern boundary, meaning given the Pappas's some additional um, buffer, uh, have we heard, or is there any concern by, I think, the property owner to the south, the De Franzes, if I'm not mistaken, if I can read that correctly? Um, because if they were to change that, then that, you know, that the amount of buffer, again, knowing that it's not 100 feet to start with, but knowing that that amount of buffer for an additional length would be um, compromised, for lack of a better term. We've heard from the, the, the Papas. I don't know if the other app, uh, the butter has any questions or concerns or has an opinion on that as well. Are the DeFranzes on the, on the call? Is anybody, uh, if they're here, if you could use the raise hand function or if somebody knows they're on the call or not on the call, um, that'd be good to know. I guess um, I'd like to take a, um somehow get get some opinion of the planning board um to build a straw poll what's that you want to do a straw poll i want to do a straw poll would uh basically would the planning would members of the planning board grant a uh, a waiver for a 100 foot buffer assuming we could set uh get some alignment or some agreement on there's going to be uh, compromises on the north side and the south side. If we, but there would need to be a waiver. Um, so I know there's some uh, variability in there, but I just want to get a general sense. Is there any, is there a willingness to grant a buffer? And uh, I'll just go for my, I'll start with myself and I'd say yes. Um, let me just go through the list and get a straw poll. How about you, Gary? Yes, I'm open to a buffer. Fran. Or, uh, no, I'm, I'm, I'm open to waiving <laughs> the buffer requirement. Uh, sorry, I miss I miss misspoke there. I, I am open to waiving the buffer requirement as long as it's minimized and is in the interest of the OS LPD. Yeah. Uh, I am not open to the buffer unless there's uh, agreement between the applicant and the Papas on the north side and the DeFranzes on the south side. Mary? I am open to approving the waiver, um, assuming it is adjusted um, as we have discussed so that um, the buffer is kind of even on the DeFranzes side and the Papas side. Deb? I'm in, in agreement uh, with the moving of the buffer so that that the both both parties um, have a say in the, the proportioning of that buffer um, and the access of who accesses it and where they access that the, either property, the, the, the river side or the southern side um, and so that everybody's happy with that. Thank you, Deb. Uh, Dave? Yes, um, I'm just sorry. I'm just getting one final look at the plan. So 
So I, just, I have a little bit of mixed emotion because I'm hearing what Fran's saying that if we're going to lower the road, I want those um, those folks to be comfortable with it. However, there there is a lot of um, space from their house to the road, and I would think that we would be able to satisfy it with some some uh, screening. So um, I'm going to be yes. I'm open for the buffering. Over. Okay. Exception. And okay. And Sundar, thanks, Dave. Um, yeah, I'm I'm in favor of uh, granting the waiver. I think I think I I was in favor even last time. So I'm I'm going to maintain my vote of granting that waiver. And um, Jane. Yes, I am also. Um, I don't know. I haven't heard much about screening. It's probably premature, but there's a lot that you can do with fencing and other types of things, even if we don't have more than 10 feet. I think that there could be some sort of compromise there for both sides to be met. And Deb, you said as long as um, there's accessibility between the buffers, that's not what I'm hearing from the planners, that there won't be accessibility out to Cedar Street. They were talking about using the road. Um, right, the that's what I understood was the road itself. But the ro yes, the road is the accessibility point. Right, but I, I got confused when Deb was talking about equal accessibility on the north and the south. So as long as that's clear and that people know that they won't be going through this buffer zone for a trail. And I'm really um, still very pleased with the um, fire lane going through because that will provide constant um, accessibility between Cedar Street and Lincoln Street. And also, I also agree with the previous conversation that the, the, um, the surface for the fire road itself is very premature at this point in time. I think you have to wait for the engineers and the fire department to weigh in. So I am in favor for this waiver at this point in time. Thanks, Jane. Uh, so, John, this come the circles back uh, to you. Did you have a, Did you see? Did you see what you needed to see? Yep. So, uh, section was it two fifteen two ten one fifteen B one says the overall concept plan shall only be re reconsidered if there is a substantial variation between the definitive plan and the concept plan. A substantial variation shall be defined as an increase in the number of lots, a decrease in the open space acreage a change in the layout which causes dwelling units or roadways to be placed closer to a dwelling unit within 500 feet of the project and or a change in the development pattern which adversely affects natural landscape features and open space. So I think that roadway, if it's within 500 feet of a, a, a budding house would probably trigger that review. So they would likely wanna get any changes to the roadway done in the concept plan phase rather than the definitive phase. So now we're back to where we were. <laughs> so, you know, are we within 500 feet of the Franza? It didn't seem like any of those that you listed would be triggered if we slid the road down. We wouldn't be changing square footage of the open space. We wouldn't be adding lots. We wouldn't be adding length to the road. Yeah, through the chair. It would basically be if there's a house within 500 feet and then you're moving the road closer it's and even if it's within the 500 even if it, feet even if, it, even if it already is within 500 feet that's my that would be my interpretation of it yeah so it might have to stay where it is well not that it have to stay where it is it's just no but yeah my, plan now my concern is that right now it's within 500 feet and we move the road 10 feet 20 feet and it's still under 500 feet it, go through a, a diff, uh, you know, variance or a revision, it seems. Yeah, it says causing dwelling units or roadways to be placed closer to a dwelling unit within 500 feet of the project. So even if they're, if it's within 400 feet and you're just moving the roadway closer to that 400 foot away house, that would trigger it. So it's not moving it within 500 feet. It's moving it closer to a house within 500 feet. Okay, that's uh, unfortunate for moving this along. Uh, um, 
I, th I think we have uh, to move this along. I think we have a. Um, there's. Uh, we know the Defranzes are not on this call. We know the Papas's would like to see more buffer. With um, I think it's up to. This plan is in front of us. Um, we can either we can decide to take a vote on the plan as shown. Um, I think that's our next step. Regardless, I don't I don't think we can just um, not take it to a vote. We, Any thoughts we can from the condition? We can condition the vote, or we can give me an example of a condition. Like what what would the condition be? The approval. The condition would be um, the um, approval is um, based on the plan as shown um, except for the location of the um, cul-de-sac off of Cedar Street where the um, the buffer open space would um, be equitable and basically split the difference between the two um, north and south so can we John can we do that can we say say something as loose as that the condi put a condition that um from you, John. yep the condition would have to be somewhat specific i mean if you say it's got to be midway between the two properties i think that's specific enough if you yeah. just say it's got to be moved so that it's more equitable that's not specific yeah um, so so i i'd say the open space has to be split between you know the north and south side um I agree yeah, so that's that's what makes sense to me, and um, and yeah, I, I couldn't I would not be able to approve unless that condition were on there. And I feel like we voted on this plan last time and did not approve it, or you know, it was because it was pretty much the same plan last Mr. time. Yeah. yeah, Gary, please. If I could just comment to to Mary's point. I mean, there there this is a different plan because they they did increase the buffer zone uh, in multiple areas. Uh, I realized that they didn't make any changes uh, along that perimeter, that 10 foot buffer zone, but there are multiple other places where they increased it. They've also increased the total open space allotment because they've made the lots smaller. So I would argue that they have made some meaningful changes. Um, I, I'd also say too that, that you know, and, and we can still take a vote on it. Um, you know, if if the applicant is willing to consider relocating or shifting that road, they can still do that for the definitive plan. Um, it just has to go through the. Uh, am, am I right, John? I mean, I think of I think of uh, you know Chamberlain and Wayland just changed their their road design. Uh, it can be changed at a later point in time, and they're going to be in front of us anyways. It's just that we don't necessarily have we can't. If we were to vote on it and we were to grant the waiver and this were to go through and get approved, then you know they're not bound to change it if it doesn't work. So yeah, I'm just I, kind of throwing yeah. that out there that, that, that we could still vote on this um, with the recommendation that they reevaluate that road location as part of the definitive plan. And then it would go through the proper notification process, the abutters would be notified and there could be some discussion around it. And if it's agreeable, then that would work. If it's not, then you know, they could, they would build it Through as the chair, just a qu uh, clarification on that. The, the difference between Chamberlain and Wayland in this is Chamberlain and Wayland is on OSLPD. Uh, so the issue is if they, if they change the road in the subdivision phase, they would need to amend the special permit concept plan to reflect that change. They can't just go and change the road layout as long as it meets those qualifications. And I think we've established that there is a house within 500 feet of the roadway. Yeah. So moving okay. would, would affect that house. Yeah. yeah I, from the last meeting, um, the reason we didn't adjust that, uh, Gary, was I, I didn't think that that 10 foot buffer was um, a major concern with the, the Pappas. What we, what we heard and what we um, wanted to revise was the 100 foot buffers um, where we could, uh, 10 feet to 15 feet or 10 feet to 20 feet. It, did, it didn't seem like that was one of the, the major items that was, that was forcing us to, um, you know, get voted down, um, we have, as the IPCAN, we have no issue putting in a, um, you know, uh, contingency that that, you know, during definitive, that that plan, uh, that we can slide that road down to, you know, give more buffer. I, we would have done that in this revision if I knew that that was a major component. Um, we thought that, you know, as a group, 
the trail system and was it was very important and your comments on larger open space so shifting that road would have gone against what you were saying so again we're trying our best um what we're really hoping for is that we we can vote on this with that contingency so we can try to move to the definitive stage um because as i commented earlier just you know we're spinning our wheels it, in the grand scheme of this project it seems like overall uh everybody's pretty happy with this project and, and it's, it's going in the right direction uh, for such a small piece to have to push this to another meeting um, or not. So vote. Through, the, through the chair, Shane, if I might politely cut you off, I think I might be able to move this along, Bob. Yeah, Dave, go ahead. So um, I, I'd like to go back to Mary's point of a condition with providing equitable green space on both sides of the road. And I'd like to, if she's um, making that motion, I'd like to second it. Yes, I'll, I'll move. I'll move that we um, accept the or we grant the waiver for the 100 foot buffers with the condition that um, they adjust the location of that road. And to make it to the, the mid, so we, we don't want to use the word midway to, I mean, to equitable. We want to use something more to be equal um, or midway? It, midway would be um, an inaccurate way to put it um, because it's basically moving the road um, so that there is equal, as you say, green space for each abutter on the north and south. 50% on each side is pretty descriptive. Okay, so Mary, oh, go ahead. I Discussion. Don't. Fran's got to Fran, Fran's not Fran's gonna blow a, a gasket if you don't call on him. <laughs> Fran, please. So we're looking to provide a buffer, not knowing what the buffer amount is, saying something that's going to be uh, halfway between. Halfway between what? Does that mean the buffer amount is going to be the same on the DeFranza side as it is going to be on the DePapa side? Yes. And is that just for the south side of the, the DePapa's property, or does it also include the east side of their property as well? Or is that not even in play? Because as I look at it, it seems like it's a very open waiver that we're looking to grant here. Move, understanding that, you know, in the definitive stage, this is all going to get worked out. And I you know, just hearing, want, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, go ahead. In fact, if I may, just, just, I'm just hearing now that a pop, uh, uh, the Papa's concern, which it, it, it didn't, I don't recall it coming up in the last meeting to this extent, but hearing the Papa's, you know, voice that concern this evening, now we're trying to kind of create something that's equitable and not knowing what the Franzas, or the DeFranzas feel about it. So it just seems like a slippery slope. I, I, I see where you're coming from, friend, but we're, we're, it's not like we're going from 100 foot to less. Um, either way, we're still below that that buffer amount. Mm -hmm. um, and we've, I understand this is coming up now. Um, you know, we've we've shown these plans. We've gone through these meetings for five months now, and and we're just at the point where we've done everything we feel like we could to in include the neighbors and and get this out there. We try our best to educate everybody, but. Um, Again, I can't stress enough that we're just trying to move to the next step. Um, to the chair, Rob, may, yes, may Dave. I just respond to Fran's comment. Um, I don't think there can be an argument on the southerly side if we're not going higher, lower, lower than fifty percent. So it's going to be equitable on both sides. So they can't say like you're giving, you were giving more to us now. And now you're getting more to the other side. We that's what the fifty percent um, puts out there for us, in my opinion. Yeah, it's and through the yeah. Go ahead, go ahead, Mary. Okay, sorry. Um, uh, I just feel that in order for this to be very clear to the DeFranzes and other mm -hmm. abutters, we can't just grant the waiver with no condition. We have to specify what we're saying if we're going to do it today. We have to say what we're what we're um, approving, because 
they would, you know, they could just look at the plans and they could say, oh, well, that's the buffer, you know, that's what it's going to be. And then they could be very surprised, you know, when it comes to the definitive plan and see that it's changed. I want to be very clear now that it is going to change. It's not that plan that we see before us. So that's mm -hmm. that's part of the reason for the condition. Um, if we're going to vote on it today, and I'm I'm fine with voting on it today as a condition, even though we don't normally do that. Um, but that's you know it's just in the interest of of getting it moving. Um, I do feel very comfortable that the developers understand what we're saying <laughs> but we just have to have something in writing so that it's clear to anybody who looks at the decision um, later um, and i also want to make make it very clear that um the papas uh, the papas buyers did talk about this in the last meeting they did express their concerns um and i i'm sorry you know there was a lot talked about obviously but they did they did talk about it it was this is not the first time they've mentioned this because i was here and i heard it so okay uh thanks mary could i make a friendly am amendment to the motion i think being more des des descriptive so we have the existing lot line of the, the Hubleys, and then we have the corner of the Pappas's property. And I think between those two points is where it, we, we could provide more equitable, uh, or should try, strive to provide more equitable buffer. And if we could say something between those point, two points, of basically providing equal open space between those two points as you go from the north side to the south side would be the condition. Agree. Mr. Chair, I, I guess I'm, <laughs> I'm struggling with putting the condition in when we're affecting the, the core design and there's an abutter that, that could be impacted by that in, in a way that, I, that, that you know, is not represented in the drawings. And, and I guess for me, and I, not to be difficult here, but I, I'd rather vote on the waiver as it's drawn now um, or um, have the applicant go back and redesign and, and, and redraw it and um, provide that materials so that all of the abutters can, can see it as it's intended. And I, I'm, you know, I just don't, I, I I really, really am uncomfortable with this sort of this terminology around splitting it or, or something like that and, and, and writing it as, as a condition when we're only hearing from abutters on one side, not on, not on both. So is, is Mike I the I, I'd, re I'd rather vote on it um, as it's currently drawn. Through the chair. Um, Thanks, to, Thanks um, Gary. Yeah, and, and I, I I would have a tendency, I, I would agree with Gary on that. I, I sort of feel like on the south side, we were really starting to get some nice distance with that, with that, uh, that fact that we were almost probably 80 feet. It looked like it was closer to the original. So my concern is if where, it, it, it's, it's very difficult to see where that curve is going or where that line of that road is gonna come down and settle in. So. I, I couldn't say, is it 50% at 20 feet from the, from Cedar Street extension, or is it, you know, 50 feet, 50, 50% 50 from what border and what edge? I, I, I really would like to see it before I approve it. And, and I, and I really would like you to move forward with it, but um, with that kind of, I think it's just not concrete enough. And, I, and the other thing is if we are gonna go back I would like to see how the trails, even in a preliminary way, how the trails are going to be accessed. If they're walk, if you are, if Cedar Street Extension is walking through the road, how are they going to be removed or re, you know, configured to sort of address the site? Um, just a little bit. It's not major. It's just what, a little, just a little more. Questions? Sorry. What are your Sorry. questions for accessibility? I'm so, yeah, so I understand that from Cedar Street, you'll be walking down the street, but what I'd like to know is where are the trails on the southern side going to meet Cedar Street, and is it even going to be possible at any spot for the for Cedar Street to, to meet the uh, Riverside? 
Um, so I guess I, I guess I just need a little tiny bit more information. Yeah, I, I know you've gone through a whole lot, and I really like what's going on in uh, Lincoln where, Street. So I just want to say that I, I understand it. Where we, we you know, we, we defined where the, the the fire road is going to be um, for access to Lincoln Street, and I, I thought we clearly um, dictated where the entrances to both the north and south open spaces are located um, on the plan. I, it, it's, to me, it's still very, uh, we're still talking, trying to get through concept plans or talking about uh, trail configurations to me is a little premature, but um, you know, I don't really know what else we can do to show how you get into the properties for, you know, from what we've already shown. Um, and then I just wanted to comment on, on Gary's point. I, Gary, I, I, I see what you're saying. Um, on, on having the DeFranza. Um, Mike, I've been emailing every other day. He's surprised he's not on the call. I've had a lot of uh, com uh, communication with him. Uh, I actually wish he was on the call so he could he could speak. But um, my only you know, point is that at that area we're looking to shift, it's, it's already under 100 feet. Um, so we're, we're going from 80 to 60, not 110 to 90. So it's, it's not like we're creating a major issue with the buffer we're, we're we're making it it's already you know out of its limit we're just making it's already it. compromised so yeah. I, I just yeah. can't see you know another redraw two weeks of 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 um you know work and planning to come back to ask for a buffer that we already we're already asking for yep i i, I totally understand that my my encouragement was to to vote on it as as it's currently drawn but Jane, go ahead. Sure. Um, I'm trying to hear and listen to everybody, and I feel the uh, developer's frustration on trying to reach out to neighbors who really appear not to be responsive. Um, I've run into this in other situations, and at some point in time, you just have to move on. And I like the idea of the condition. Uh, you're willing to make it as much as close to 50 50 as you can. And I don't know what else you can. I don't know what waiting for another abutter to come in and voice their opinion, how that would change. I, I would vote for the condition to go forward with the waiver with the condition. I don't think we can do anything else. You can't force people to come and weigh in if they don't want to. So Rob, why don't we vote on the condition? Times. Yeah, well, let's, uh, uh, let's, there, there was a, there was a motion and then there was a second. Mary, would you like to restate your motion? Okay. I move to um, waive the 100 foot buffer requirement with the condition that the access road from Cedar Street be adjusted in location to, uh, uh, somebody just said, Jane, you just said it very well. As um, close to 50-50 as you can make it. To make it as close to 50-50 as possible between the um, open space and buffer on the northern side and the southern side. So, so through the chair, I, I am the second, but I have a question for John. Should we vote on just adding the condition or should we vote on um, the waiver. approving the waiver and with the condition? waiver with the condition. So this is a unique situation. Um, basically it would be, and this is kind of off the cuff of how I'm saying this, it would be granting the waiver, making a finding in the overall decision, and then inserting a condition that says something like the applicant shall provide a revised plan showing the new layout of the road, which will, um, mm -hmm which will address the uh, how, a better way to say this, which will show the open space on either side as close to 50% as possible or as practicable. Um, I think it's, it's really kind of a three step thing. I don't, you can't really condition a waiver because the right, let's, part of the decision. Let's, let's take it one at a time. So the first part is I'd like to entertain a motion to grant a waiver to the 100 foot buffer requirement. Then so the, the, so moved. Do we have a second? Seconded. And so, so discussion. I, I want to make sure that we are not going to not condition <laughs> for that, for that plan to be revised. 
So, so we're yes. doing it reversed order here. So through, through the chair, I think we have a point of order here. I think we have to vote on the motion in the second before we can bring another motion in. I think, well, what I heard from John is we can't do what you were, what you were, what was on the table. We can't vote for the waiver okay. with the condition in that, in that manner. So Mr. Chair, the, the board should vote that motion down then. Okay, I, I can withdraw that motion to make it cleaner. And um, so we have to go in this order, I'm assuming we have to go. We have to do the, the waiver, waiver before the finding. No. Okay, because I'd, I'd really prefer to do the finding first so that we can condition having that um, that new plan. All right, I will I will draw my motion. And so if you'd like to like to restate the finding that we can vote on. So John, Mr. Chair, I would, I would I would suggest you kind of do this all at once. If you're going to approve the application or if the board feels as if they're going to approve the application, they should make all of the findings, one of them being that the applicant uh, is going to change the layout to make the open space as equal as possible on either side uh, and then approve the waiver and then approve the application, the special permit with the condition that this plan is to be revised as shown uh, or as, as discussed, however we want to word it. It's a very complex way of doing this. Yeah, you're going to, you're going to need to walk me through this here. Uh, <laughs> so, 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 so Mr. Chair, so all we're going to do is we're not going to vote on the way we're going to push the, the waiver vote until after we list out and vote on the findings. Correct. Okay. So on the outline, drop number seven to make it 12.1.2. So is Mary making a motion on the findings? Or do we just vote on it? I think I think Rob has to do all this. So, so we're gonna in the outline seven dot one or seven is moved is going to be moved to the end. It's going to be two dot twelve dot one uh, two dot one dot two I guess. So let me discuss discuss conditions of approval. Hey, hey, Rob, uh, I'll yep. throw my offer out there. Would you like me to, to uh, we do have to read out loud the proposed conditions. Would you like me to um, read those so that you can um, wordsmith the additional conditions that we might want to add? Yeah, that would be great. Okay. So uh, I'm just going to read here from section 2.10.2, the proposed conditions. Uh, number one, a town clerk certified version of the special permit shall be recorded at the Middlesex County Registry of Deeds prior to the issuance of a building permit for the work that is subject to this decision. Number two, the director of municipal inspections inspects projects and their construction for compliance with the approved special permit decision. This includes the driveway, roadway, and infrastructure construction shown on the plan. If the director of municipal inspections determines at any time before or during construction that a registered, or prof registered professional engineer or other such outside professional is required to assist with the inspections, of the stormwater management system or any other component of the special permit, the applicant shall be responsible for the cost of those inspections. Number three, all construction activities shall adhere to the applicable local, state, and federal laws and regulations regarding noise, vibration, dust, sedimentation, the use of, inter use of interference with or blocking of town roads. Number four, the applicant shall be responsible for mitigating all construction-related impacts, including erosion, siltation, and dust control. The applicant shall maintain all portions of any public way used for construction access free of soil, mud, or debris, deposited due to use by construction vehicles associated with the project and shall regularly sweep such areas as determined by the director of municipal inspections in consultation with the DPW director. Number five, the applicant shall regularly remove construction trash and debris from the site in accordance with good construction practice and the construction management plan. No tree stumps, demolition material, trash or debris shall be burned or buried on the site. Number six, all exterior lighting within the development project, whether shown in the approved plan or required by the Massachusetts State Building Code, shall be shielded, directed downward and not upward or outward, and shall not spill onto adjacent property. 
Number seven, all fixed mechanical equipment on the site shall be screened from view from the ground. Such screening shall be sufficient in the opinion of the director of municipal inspections. Number eight, a, complete, a completed signed construction management plan shall be submitted to the planning board prior to the commencement of site work. The applicant shall also submit a revised full site plan set, which incorporates all the modifications made during the public hearing process and any required in this decision. Number nine, erosion and sedimentation control measures shall be implemented during the construction period in accordance with the approved site plan and the construction management plan. If they are found to be inadequate, the applicant shall immediately correct any deficiencies. Number 10, the planning board shall receive a sign off confirming that the site contractor and any major subcontractors have received the construction management plan prior to the commencement of any site work. Number 11, construction may occur only between the hours of 7 a.m. and 7 p.m. Monday through Friday and Saturdays between 8 a.m. and 4 p.m. pursuant to Chapter 141, Article I of the Town of Hopkinton General Bylaws. Number 12, the applicant shall submit final as-built plans to the planning board prior to the issuance of certificate of occupancy. Number 13, a completed signed SWPPP shall be provided to the planning board prior to issuance of a building permit. Number 14, the applicant slash developer shall provide the principal planner with a project point of contact and contact information prior to the issuance of a building permit. The point of contact information shall be kept current through, through correspondence to the principal planner until the final certificate of occupancy is issued or construction is otherwise considered complete. Number 15, the applicant shall install a gate barrier between the two cul-de-sacs on the access road that is determined to be acceptable by the fire chief. And this is where I think we had uh, condition 16. The amount of open space is split 50-50 from the Hubley lot line to the corner of the Pappas property with the open space on the southerly side along the length of the road off of Cedar Street extension. Rob, I just have one thought. Could you make it something like as close to 50-50 because I'm not sure what kind of um, geo geographical implications they're gonna run into. A lot of this stuff is premature, but if they can justify why they can't get to 50-50, you know, if you're saying it's close to 50-50, they could explain why or why not. Is that feasible, John? Yes, yeah, so usually the language would be, uh, how, can you read it again? And I'll just insert the other part. The amount of open space is split 50-50 from the Hubley lot line to the corner of the Pappas property with the open space on the southerly side along that length of road off of Cedar Street extension. So it would be the open space is, is uh, I don't know if you want to say split 50-50, but um, the open space is divided 50% on either side of the road or as, a, or as close as practicable. Thank and you. Okay, let's, uh, so let's rephrase with John's word. The, open, the amount of open space is divided as close to 50%. The open, the open space shall be uh, the amount of open space on either side of the newly proposed roadway shall be split 50% on either side or as close as practicable. As long as you can get like the main language, we can wordsmith it in the decision. Um, okay. But... And Steph, you have that and everybody on the board in, in sync with uh, that, that condition? Yeah. All right. So do I need to make a motion to approve the conditions? So uh, you want to go through the outline and make sure that everything is satisfied because once you once you make the, the votes on the findings and then the waivers and the conditions, that's essentially the vote on the application. So um, you may want to, uh, let me just get up to the outline. You may want to close out number eight, number nine, uh, number 10, and then you can vote to close the public hearing at the end after all the other votes are taken, but then you'll want to do 12 uh, with the findings, then the waiver, then the conditions, if I read the board correctly. That's how the board wanted to do it. Okay, uh, so we're on, on our outline, we're on number eight, discuss, discuss conditions of approval. And I think we've done that unless people have other conditions. I think that Gary read them very well. I'm going to commend his reading. Okay, perfect. So any other comments there? If not, I'm moving on to the section, uh, subsection nine, standards, findings, review decision criteria. 
That's 2.4. All right, decision criteria pursuant to 210-115 of the zoning bylaws, the application process for an open space and landscape preservation development is comprised of two steps. In the first step, the applicant submits a concept plan, which is what we're doing here, which describes the overall development plan. The planning board shall grant or deny a special permit based upon the information contained in the concept plan. And it lists them out here. 210-115.A part three, special permit criteria. The special permit shall be granted only if the planning board finds each of the following. The development meets the purpose of an open space and landscape preservation development as described in 210-106. The development standards contained in 210-112A 1 through 4 have been met. The common open space is designed in accordance with the standards set forth in 210-113B. The common open space is designed in accordance with the standards set forth in 210-113C. The parcel could be developed as conventional subdivision under existing state, local, federal land use regulations. The open space and landscape preservation development provides for efficient use and delivery of municip municipal and other services and infrastructure. So we're moving on. Is there any comments there or we're gonna move on to special permit? Uh, we just went, uh, Is what do we, We listed out the conditions. What do we need to list out for findings? So the findings are written down and these can be changed and should be changed uh, to meet what the board is looking for with the waiver, but they are in section 2.9. All right, thanks, John. Rob, to the chair. Just yeah, before, friends. Before we get into 2.9, maybe this is a question back to John. Um, has it been shown definitively that this can be developed as a um, conventional plan? Well, that would be the determination of the board. Uh, so it's in the opinion, I believe, and Phil could weigh in, it's the opinion on the engineer that the through road as a conventional could be developed and could be approvable. Uh, and I believe that's that's what we decided, but it's, it's ultimately the determination of the board as to whether they believe the conventional would be approvable. To the chair, can we just have confirmation from Theta? Right. Thank you, Dave. Phil, if you're uh, near near your uh, your headset, uh, mind chiming in? Here. What was? Uh, what am so, I chiming? No, just looking for confirmation uh, from your evaluation that the conventional plan between Cedar Street Extension and Lincoln Street could be built as shown yes. in the conventional concept plan. So the so yes, you've got confirmation it can be. Thank you. Okay, so section two dot uh, two dot nine findings. Um, let me I'm So how do I want to change the wording here, uh, John, to, to, uh, to satisfy what we've been talking about? Um, so there, there should be something added in that, um, how do I word this? Um, the applicant has made it clear that they are willing to alter the layout of the road to increase the open space or to uh, shouldn't say increase the open space to divide the open space equally along the north and south edges of the roadway. Um, similar, it's going to be similarly worded to the condition, but you just want to make it clear in the findings that um, that is something the board is considering with this decision. Okay. So let me, let me read it. Let me see if I can. Um... Jerry's like, I'm glad Rob got this one. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I move that the board finds that the proposed open space and landscape preservation development conforms to the provisions of article 
se uh, 17, that all applicable criteria and standards set forth in the zoning bylaws chapters 210 have been satisfied and the granting of the special permit will be in harmony with the general purpose and intent of the zoning bylaws chapter 210. In addition, it is understood the applicant has made it clear they have a willingness to divide the open space on the northerly side and the southerly side off of the new road off of Cedar Street extension as as mentioned in the conditions. So, Mr. Chair, I would say maybe say um, conforms to the provisions of Article 17, with the exception of the buffer waiver, which is oh, I got to look it up. Whatever the section number is, we can fill that in later. Um, and the applicant is altering the road, and the alt and the applicant will provide a plan showing the revised layout of the road which will increase the open space uh, provided on the northern side of the road so that the open space on both sides is as close to 50% as practicable. How does that sound? Perfect. Do I need to restate that or? Uh... No, you can just say that as what I said. Hopefully Steph got it. Steph. So as, as John outlined, uh, I'd like to entertain a motion to, right, we need to, do we need to take a motion here to accept the findings? Yes. Um, sorry, just a point of order. Do we, before we actually vote on the findings, do we want to take any last final public comment? I think that's a good idea, uh, Gary. This has been a, um, a long journey, so I think it's, uh, appropriate to have opportunity for the public to to add any comments before we vote as a board and uh, anyone new to this uh, if you want to use the raise hand function of zoom or turn your camera on and wave feverishly we'll uh, we'll see you And actually, to the chair, I think according to the order, it's saying we have to close the hearing before we vote. Is that true? Oh. Uh, we have Sripaya Srinarovis. Uh, yeah, that's me, Sripaya Srinivas, 34 Lincoln Street, Hopkinton. Yep. So for the last uh, five months, I've had only one concern, which I've been bringing up in front of everybody. Right now, to the south of me is all woods. West of me is all woods. Southwest of me is all woods. After this project, I'm going to have a road that goes up the hill on southwest. I'm going to have uh, vehicles that come down that street. I'm going to have through traffic, not trails, not people walking. I'm going to have, I'm not, sorry, not through traffic. I'm just going to have traffic, people going up and down. Um, it's, it's totally opposite to what I have today. And I know I've got a couple of suggestions by the applicant, which, um, which is not, you know, which is more like a plan B th than the plan A, which, which I had suggested to tweak the road, to not have that bend in front of me, just to straighten up just a tad bit. Now that Shane is leading this discussion here, you know, I, I'm presenting my concern again and again in every meeting as much as I would like them to really not uh, mute me out uh, with this concern because, um, you know, this is our home, our, our lifestyle and our uh, future. So I would really request him to see how he can tweak this bend that's right in front of my house into like kind of like a straighter line, just so that it doesn't affect us, it doesn't affect him, it doesn't affect any of their value, our value in any way. I've been proposing this for like, I don't even remember how many more months, but, 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 but I'm gonna keep bringing it up uh, until something comes out of this basically. So. Thank you very much. Uh, Shane, do, do, would you uh, like to comment? Um, yeah, I, there must be some confusion. Um, we did a very detailed analysis of the engineering behind her issue, um, sent a very detailed email with plans. I, I take it she didn't get that email because uh, we definitely took that into um, you know, you know, very, a very important item. And we put a lot of time and thought into it and um, proposed, you know, basically gave further explanation on, on the scenario she has, she's having issues with and to, and 
try to explain that what she's trying to do would actually make the cause worse. Um, and that no, so I, I, sorry, hey, sorry, uh, hold, hold on one second. Just please uh, address to the chair first. Sharpaya. Okay, may I address to the chair? Yep, go ahead. So at, at one point, it was told that the road, um, you know, that the, the lights would go up my roof and it would not, uh, it would, it would actually, I mean, the current proposal that they have, the lights would actually hit the roof and it wouldn't hit the home. But the car that starts at the top of a cul-de-sac, if it hits the roof, it's one straight line. So as it's coming down, it's the roof and then it's the window and then it's the entire house and then the car car's turn right so i'm unable to picture how a car starts right at the top and then how the headlights just disappear and you know there's probably some kind of a misunderstanding over there but that's the reason why i was proposing that what if we didn't you know just that little angle that's there in front of the house what if we didn't have that like what are the things that could go wrong for the developer if we didn't have that bend in what if the what if it started right up and then it just went slightly behind the trees, maybe. I don't know. Uh, I even sent like a sample picture of, you know, I drew my own like a little straight line with a, with the, with a little like a Microsoft PF thing just to see if that was possible. I'm, I'm sure you did a lot of detailed analysis, mm -hmm. but it's just that um, it, I'm not able to picture how that would increase the problem for for us it, because it's- it deviates. Yeah. So, thanks, so, thanks, Rupaya. Dave, please go ahead. Through the chair, I, I think um, it'd be very difficult to um, relocate the road, but what I'd suggest and ask the uh, applicant is if they've talked about um, any kind of screening, uh, tall screening to prevent any kind of bikes coming in. Yeah. And uh, Sapaya, you, you said you hadn't heard from us um, and we were blocking you off for five months. So did you get receipt of that email? So I live on a slope, Shane. I don't know how you would put really long trees. Here it's a receipt of the email as you claim that we haven't been in contact with you. No, I said I received an email as saying about the trees, which is more like a plan B. The plan A, I would prefer that this road was straightened out, which I mentioned okay. right in the beginning of this conversation. All right, thank, uh, thank you very much. Is there, is there any additional uh, um, comments? All right, so I'd so like to- I, 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 Rob, if I may, I know that's not a public comment, but I would just, I mean, it sounds like, just to kind of fill in the blanks on that, Rob sent, an, or the applicant sent an email to the abutter. I'm not sure what was in the email, was it to provide additional screening or, because it doesn't sound like the abutter has resolution to the issue. And I, I think it's important, right? So, uh, well, yeah, yeah. So Courtney has been speaking with Surprise. She can she can tell you about their conversations. She's discussed screening. She's discussed all different uh, means and methods. Um, we did a, an analysis on the engineering. The the cul-de-sac elevation. If, if we're going to talk about this and get into details, the cul-de-sac elevation where the car would be facing her house is approximately 19 feet um, over her window elevation. Um, by the time the car comes down the hill and is at the elevation where it would hit her windows, it, the car is already past her house. She wants to straighten the road out, which actually goes downhill, which allows the car to be at grade, which is shining light directly into the windows. We did a detailed analysis on this to, to tell her that, you know, how we have it designed will not have any effect on her lights in her windows. And we've sent plans and maps and 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 we never heard anything back. And, and, and her opening statement was she didn't receive, the, you know, any feedback and that's, it's, that's incorrect. We've done everything we can to, to prove that this is, um, you know, not going to be a hindrance, and, and are willing to work with her in, in anything we need to do. We made that clear. Thank you. So just All right. Quick, Thank you. Quick comment, quick comment through the chair in response to that, and maybe um, address Grant's concern. Is this something we want to condition, or is something we just want to move on? To the chair, Rob, I, I feel like this is something between the applicant and the abutter. I I completely agree, Fran. Um, one one uh, more con uh, 
I, I had a pot, Pappas, I saw your hand raised <laughs> in the picture here. Uh, can you unmute yourself or? I, I just wanted to say that um, Courtney was really gracious. She did come and walk with us and she talked to us. The, the, the key piece that was not uh, explained to us, which uh, unfortunately until last meeting became clear to us, was that for them to apply for the kind of, uh, um, I guess, planning that they were going for in order to have um, all the trails in it, um, that there was a required 100 foot buffer zone. That was never ever mentioned to us. We just assumed that the property line was the property line. And so our apologies if, if our comments seem out of the blue, but it wasn't until last meeting that we saw everybody else with 80 feet um, and us going, wait, what? Um, so our apologies for seemingly muddling everything up. Uh, uh, appreciate appreciate your comment. Thank you very much. All right, uh, if, I'm hoping we can move this to a vote. So, I'd like to entertain a motion to. So, through the chair, quick point of order. I I, I kind of asked this question before, but we never got an answer to it. According to the agenda, I think it says we're supposed to close the hearing before the votes. Uh, I think John has said in the past we don't need to okay. technically That's do that. Fine. That's fine. Right. The public hearing just usually needs to be closed. So the decision is due after the close of a public hearing, uh, just statutorily. It, there's no there's no requirement that it has to be closed before you make a decision. Okay, thanks. And, and so in the order, point of clarification, Rob, the order with which we're voting now is first the findings, then the conditions, then the waivers. Is that correct? I believe that is correct. That's what I had planned. Mr. Chair, and I thought- Waiver, I then the, condition. Yeah, waivers and then conditions. All right, let's, so I'd like to entertain a motion to approve a waiver, um, approve a waiver of the 100 foot buffer requirement. Mr. Raman, so moved. Is there a second? Second. Thanks, Jane. Discussion. So through discussion. discussion, yes, Fran. So um, I'm going to vote no on this, Robin. I want to make my opinion known is that without definitive plans identifying the amount of the buffer zone or the the, the amount of feet both on the north side and the south side, um, I, I don't feel even having the condition that we we've, we've included um, satisfied my requirements to uh, allowing them a waiver for this uh, approving for this particular waiver. I appreciate that, Fran. So uh, any more discussion points? So through roll call vote, um, Gary. Gary Trundle, yes. Fran. Fran Young, no. Mary. Mary Larson Marlowe, yes. Deb. You're on mute. Deb, you're on mute. Deborah Feinberg, no. Dave. Dave Paul, yes. Sundar. Sundar Sivraman, yes. Jane. Jane Moran, yes. And Rob is a yes. So the waiver passes. Uh, six yeses, two noes. So we're moving to the next, the next step here. And that's the findings, correct? No, it should have been the findings first. We just approved the waiver. I thought it was finding waivers and then conditions. I mean, that, sorry, Mr. Chair, that's that's how we were talking about it, but it doesn't necessarily matter as long as you just do all of it. <laughs> Let's go for it. Okay, so I would recommend the you do the finding decision now. Yep. Okay, so I move, uh, so the findings, I move the findings that the board finds the proposed open space and landscape preservation development conforms to the provisions of article 17 
except for the 100 foot buffer requirement and the applicant is open to clearly um, dividing the open space between the northerly side and southerly side off of the road of Cedar Street Extension as detailed in the conditions. So moved. Is there a second? Second. So Dave is moved the motion, Jane seconded. So th through roll call vote, Gary. Gary Trendle, yes. Fran. Fran Dion, yes. Mary. Mary Larson Marlowe, yes. Deb. Deborah Feinberg, yes. Dave. Hey, Paul, yes. Sundar. Yes. Jane. Jane Marin, yes. And Rob is a yes. Okay. So uh, this is, um, do I, I just need to approve the special permit at this point or is there some other step? Take a vote for the special permit or do I need to? Conditions? The board could, condition. board could approve, sorry, Mr. Chair, the board could uh, approve the application if that's what they choose based on the conditions that were read aloud or they could vote separately on the conditions. Let's, so, let's vote. Go ahead, Gary, you had a so, comment. Uh, I'll move to approve the special permit uh, with the conditions uh, as uh, read aloud previously in the hearing. Second. Thank you. Dave Paul, second. All right, so Gary moved the motion. Uh, Dave seconded the roll call vote. Gary. Gary Trendle, yes. Fran. Yes. Mary. Mary Larson Marlowe, yes. Deb. Deborah Feinberg, yes, but I would like to say to give an extra step um, for the applicant to discuss with some of the unhappy neighbors and um, the, the future plan and, and or the questions that have been stated. Thank you, Deb. Uh, Dave. Dave Paul, yes. Sundar. Sundar Subraman, yes. Jane. Jane Marin, yes. And Rob Benson is a yes. And so I, I can close the public hearing at this point. So I'd like I'll to entertain him. Close the public hearing. Second. Someone's, all right, Dave, second. So through roll call vote, closing the public hearing. Um, Gary. Gary Trindle, yes. Fran. Fran Dion, yes. Mary. Mary Larson Marlowe, yes. Deb. Feinberg, yes. Dave Paul. Dave Paul, yes. Sundar. Sundar Saraman, yes. Jane. Jane Marin, yes. And Rob Benson is a yes. So that closes the public hearing for Deer Ridge Estates. So I'm gonna, so congratulations, you've got through the open space concept plan and um, thank you for bearing with us as a board. Um, nice job, Rob. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> thank you. And I'd like to, I'd like to hand uh, the baton back to Gary. Uh, this has been a trying process, <laughs> but, uh, but All right. uh, thank you. Thanks, Rob. And uh, Probably not the orientation into to chairing a, uh, a hearing that you were quite expecting, but appreciate all your diligence and perseverance through it. Um, so thanks, Rob. I know these are tough and, and uh, I've had my, uh, these are not as easy as it, as it might appear to folks. There's a lot of complexities and, and uh, you know, it's tricky. So I, I really, really applaud Rob on, on taking it through us, taking this, taking us through it. Um, so we are uh, done with one of three tonight. Uh, 
Um, I, I would say though that I think um, we allotted that some extra time in part because they've been through a very lengthy process already. Uh, I'm going to ask that we adhere to the timing guidelines for our remaining hearings, uh, particularly as it is already 930. Um, so next up on the list is um, Zero South Street with REC Hopkinton. And uh, I see Kathy is on. John is on. Good evening. Thanks for your patience. I know that was uh, a long one to get through, but I know you guys have uh, been through long processes before. Um, so just um, we'll start with the outline. And um, we did have, I think, a very uh, helpful site walk on Saturday to take a look. Um, I think that there are, um, you know, very helpful just to, to, to see that and also in particular see the retention basin um, that we had some questions about um, that serves the town. Um, next on the agenda for us is um, detailed discussion on the decision criteria. Um, and uh, I guess really quickly while I just flip to this page, I'm wondering if the applicant has any other updates for us as a board since the last time we met. No, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I think you. Um, I'll, I'll be very brief. We, we we met on site, which I think was very very beneficial. I, I think the um, the board could could get a, a sense for how far back into the um, property the site uh, the building was set and what the um, you know the tree canopy around the, the the property was. So I think we got a very very good idea of of, of that from being being out on on site. Since the last meeting, we also had um, we uh, submitted a response to Beta's um, review of, of of our resubmittal. Um, there was a, a couple comments that were uh, were left open that we had responded to. Uh, in my opinion, I believe we've addressed um, everything adequately. Um, everything I think was pretty pretty minor. There weren't any really major comments left there. I, I don't want to speak. For um, uh, for for Phil, uh, but that has been submitted to um, to the board as well, and I'd be happy to go over that in in detail if uh, the board desires. All right, maybe we'll uh, look to Mr. Mr. Paradis if you could just comment on those updates from the applicant for Zero South Street. So yes, uh, so we, we received the uh, 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 a response letter to our la latest submission. Um, I think the only, so there are some things that, that the board may wanna discuss and condition relative to easements um, for the drainage basin on the site and as well as uh, the pavement area that extends onto the site. Um, I do want to call the attention to the um, additional volume of runoff. So uh, the commission, the stormwater regulations have a interesting uh, requirement in that uh, it requires that the applicant um, document the additional volume of runoff from the site. Uh, although it doesn't, it doesn't prohibit them from increasing the volume, nor does the storm, uh, the Massachusetts stormwater uh, standards. Um, however, I just want to point out that the, the calculations provided indicated anywhere from uh, 0.44 to 0.57 uh, additional acre feet of volume generated as, as a result of this project. And we uh, we just thought it might be best to document, uh, I mean, you know, it, it, it largely uh, drains to a, um, uh, it drains to the adjacent uh, wetland area, uh, but it's also, that wetland area is also adjacent to the, na uh, the neighbor. So we just wanna make sure that that ex extra volume wasn't gonna adversely impact uh, the neighbor. Um, so that's about it. 
Okay. So <clears throat> sorry, Phil. I I I lost you there partway through. So can you just again paraphrase there? Is there another requested? Uh, is there re is there additional information being requested of the applicant for you to be comfortable with that requirement? Um, I think it's it's prudent to uh, figure out where the additional volume is going to if if in any especially the direct abutter to the wetland. Um, I, I don't know what the address is, but the wetland is pretty adjacent to the to their parking lot. I, I am not familiar with the topography out there. So um, I, I, I we didn't investigate that when we were on a site visit, but. And, and I, I can speak to that if the if the chair would like. Please do Mr. Cusich. Sure. And I think when we're on the site, um, essentially everything from, from our property uh, essentially drains to a very large wetland system on the, um, I guess it's the southern portion of the of, of the site. From there, that wetland is then collected and goes through a culvert underneath Salt Street and, and continues on on its way. The stormwater system, as as designed, mimics the existing drainage patterns uh, as as required by the stormwater standard. Uh, it also reduces the peak rates of runoff as, as required by the stormwater standard. Uh, there is an increase in volume, as is typically the case when you have a when you have a development. You create paved areas, and as such, more water would will run off site. The regulations essentially require you to hold back that water and let it out at a, snow, a slower rate in requirement, in, you know, in accordance with the regulations. Uh, that is what we do, and we comply both with the state and the local um, design criteria. Uh, so we're not creating any undue flooding or changing the drainage impacts on our abutting um, neighbor. Everything essentially goes through a, um, a culvert um, and continues under the, the road as it, as it does today. Okay, so you're effectively saying that there's, there's no substantial impact um, on the abutting wetlands as a result of this development. Yes, I can, yep, I can say that with confidence. Okay. Questions or comments on that from the board? Because I, I know we had some discussion about the, the whole stormwater management system on the site walk as well. And I wanna make sure that we capture that discussion here and that we're all clear. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I knew you were going to raise your hand, Fran. I could tell the way you were you were looking intently at the materials on your screen. Go ahead, Fran. So uh, we did have the conversation on site, uh, and uh, John kind of alluded to what he just mentioned here um, in terms of how the drainage works and the culvert and back underneath South Street. Uh, I, maybe the question is back for Phil at Beta. Um, is, are we comfortable with that? Is that you know, how the, the plan that he has laid out or, or kind of the explanation that he's provided, you know, for that runoff, um, does that work? And that does not then have an adverse impact to the neighbor on the south side. So just want to confirm that that's indeed the case. Yeah. So unfortunately, I did not walk walk that that uh, process and I didn't observe the, the culvert. So I don't I don't have a idea of how much additional water would would impact it um, you know to be fair um, you know it's it's not likely unless unless there's some sort of impedance between the wetlands and the culvert um, and in a in a significant event so um, I don't know if that helps you at all but I can't. I can't say definitively, but um, I, I do understand the drainage pattern that that uh, John, John has uh, mentioned. So, um. so, 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 Phil, and I'm trying to not get too technical for us here, but but do you have any recommendations for how we might resolve this this open item? Because I, 
you know, I know that, that you've said it would be nice to have this analysis. The applicant is saying it's really not necessary with some explanation why. Um, I, I'd love to have the two of you on the same page. And for me, if the two of you are on the same page, then I'm comfortable with it. Whereas, candidly, Phil, if you're not in alignment with the applicant, then I'd love to find some way to, 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 to get some alignment there. Yeah, I, I think we just need to know what happens with that volume, where it goes. Uh, but, definitive. So, so I, I can share my screen and show you that the culvert is actually right on the division of the property line. You know, so it doesn't, it's not like it washes off onto the abutters property. That, that culvert is actually located right on the southerly property line. And how big is the culvert? That's 36 inch. It's a, it's a pretty big culvert. So that's, wow. that's actually on the survey document. I can, I can share that document and show you in the screen, but it is on the, um, on the southerly property line and just follows the same drainage pattern as it does today. That, that whole area is a, is a wetland. Mr. Gelsich, can you let um, Mr. Kusich share his screen? You should be able to right now. Okay. Bear with me. Let's see. All right. Could everybody see um, the top screen here, the survey? Yep. Okay, great. So that's the, the, the site in, in question. It's here's the, uh, the northerly property line. Here's the southerly property line. This is that detention basin that we saw out in the in the field. And the building is located probably right about right about here. Everything will come down into this wetland system. You can see the wetland on, on both sides. And this is a is a massive wetland system. So essentially our whole southern portion of the property is a wetland. And when you go over the southerly property line located right over here, this is wet too. So right in the middle of a wetland, the culvert that takes that drains this wetland is located right here. Uh, it's a 36 inch culvert right on the intersection of the property line and the right of way line. Um, so we're really we're, we're keeping the water in the wetland where it is today and directing it to that 36 inch um, that 36 inch pipe as it as it does today. Um, so really, I think anything we're doing with that additional um, volume that would be created by a development, it, it really, I don't, I don't see how that would negatively impact um, the abutter to the, to the south, uh, particularly seeing how it's, it's a wetland there anyway. And the discharge point, the ultimate discharge point is through that uh, 36 inch pipe uh, located at the uh, intersection of the property line. So it seems as if, 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 the system is working as it's intended to now. Uh, it, it seems to me that it should, this is what you've been saying, John, is that it, it should be able to absorb any minimal impact from development because it is such a substantial culvert anyways. That is that's that kind is of what I'm, that's what I'm hearing. Yes. And I, I just don't, like I said, I, I am not the professional engineer, so that's why I'm hoping that we can find a way to get Mr. Paradis comfortable with that. Mm -hmm. So just uh, from the uh, calculations provided, uh, the two year storm has a runoff volume of 0.85 acre feet. Uh, they're proposing the post development is 1.29 or 40, 44, uh, 0.44 or more than 50% uh, in, increase in volume. Um, so on a long-term impact of, you know, that water has to go somewhere. So, um, you know, that's, I just want to make you aware of that, but. <clears throat> okay. So, so Mr. Kel, Mr. Uh, Mr. Kusich, uh, a 50% increase sounds significant to me. Yeah. It, so the, the, the volume of water doesn't increase. And I think on, on any development, unless you're developing it in an area of sands where you can get it back in the ground, you're going to have more volume that runs off the site. That, that's you know the, the nature of, of development. What you need to be able to do, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> what you need to be able to do, and this is why the state outlines it in their, in their requirements, and it's also in the local, your local requirements, you need to hold back the peak flows 
So essentially, that's why you have the detention basins that we have on the site. Even though there's more water going into that, the basins that we construct will hold back that water, and let it out slowly. And it does that such that the pipes that are in place, the infrastructure that is in place will continue to operate as, as designed. So you're not overburdening that. Um, so, so again, and that's why we provide the calculations for the a reduction in peak rate of runoff, which, which we have. And again, it's what the state requires us to, to, to look at. So th there absolutely is more water coming off site as there would be with essentially every development that you have will have more water running off site. You just need to mitigate it, um, to mitigate the, the peak flows. Okay, so, so I, I'm gonna, you know, I, I, I'd like to keep moving on this, but I, I do wanna make sure that, that we get Mr. Paradis's uh, alignment on it. So, um, you know, I, I, I think I'm hopeful we can get through this pretty quickly tonight, but um, it, is this something we could condition that uh, the applicants and uh, beta are, I just, I'm trying to trying to. This seems like something that we should be able to come to terms on, but I'm I'm struggling a little bit from a process perspective, how to keep moving forward because it's very clear that it's it's information and data that our uh, consultant is is looking for. Um, Jane, go ahead, Jane. Um, sure. So this is a question for um, Phil. Do you think that the two stormwater um, retention ponds that uh, they've uh, introduced are enough to take on this additional storm water in extreme events to satisfy what you're looking for? So as, as John mentioned, um, he, he is correct in that the peak rate of runoff has been attenuated by this. Um, but as, as, uh, as a stormwater engineer, it, that, that may not always be the, 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 the issue, I'd, so the, the state is o only interested in the, the peak rate of volume. Um, some towns have also added additional uh, requirements that require a balance relative to the volume of runoff as well, which, which is prudent. I'm, I don't know, in this case, the additional volume of runoff is gonna have a, a detrimental effect uh, to the adjacent property or downstream of butters. Um, a 36 inch culvert is, is fairly significant. Uh, however, if the watershed is um, such a large go, a draining to this that it's already compromised, additional volume uh, will just exacerbate a, a problem. Um, I don't know that there's a problem. And I think we maybe uh, a second uh, look at um, Kind of the watershed that goes here or, and or the storage volume within this wetland. The The plan does not depict any contours within the wetland so it's hard to say that it can be stored in the wetland or and or it runs directly into the culvert. Um, so. Okay. Uh, so, just a follow-up question? Yeah, go ahead Jane. Um, do you think um, you visiting the site walk and determining if an additional retention basin would be necessary or not? Would that solve the issue? Um, I I mean, I, I, I would be able to see if, if, if there was an issue. I would like some, some, uh, some confirmation from the design engineer that he's looked at it. Um, so um, in some, it, some fashion to make sure it's not an issue. Yeah, and that is typically what we will look at it, that the state regulations, essentially, the presumption is there is no, if you mitigate your peak flows, the presumption is you're not causing any, you're not doing anything that would cause downstream flooding. If there was a known downstream flooding issue, then you would look at it a little, a little bit closer and to see what was causing that issue and there was something you can do about that. In, in this particular case, based on, on what we've seen on site and, and what we're aware of, we're not aware of any downstream flooding issues in this particular area. Um, so what you typically would do is design to the, 
to the to the state standards, which say that you've got to reduce rates, not 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 volumes. Well, you know, just in the interest of time, because I I I I think at the end of the day, I want to make sure that our our town consultant is is comfortable with this design. Um, I'm going to suggest we move forward right now. Um, as I said before, we are going to stay firm on our time allotments, and I realize that that is is likely going to push us to another meeting. But we have another hearing after this one. Uh, we're already a long ways in, and maybe we can make some progress um, through the decision criteria and other considerations um, so that we can shorten the amount of time uh, that we're here um, at the next meeting. Does that seem fair to everyone? I just, uh, again, I think, I think Mr. Paradis is looking for a little bit more analysis and confirmation. Um, I don't think we're going to get that uh, in this meeting tonight. So. I would like to ask that the applicant uh, work with Mr. Paradis to, to provide that additional analysis and calculations so that um, we can, that he's, he's comfortable with this. Right, I'll, I'll reach out to him to see what would satisfy okay. this concern. Thank you. Um, okay, so as we get into the detailed discussion, um, you know, the, the primary decision criteria is conformance with the site plan standards. Um, and so I think what there's quite a few of them. I think we can move through these pretty quickly. Um, yes, Mary. I, I was just holding my comment until we concluded that discussion. But um, if we're, we're still talking about wetlands and stormwater, is that the right place in the agenda? Um, there are, let's see, there are some other stormwater components in the site plan standards, but um, if it's related to overall stormwater management, then uh, yes, by I, all means, let's ask the question. I think it might be, <laughs> Okay. as much as I can tell. Um, so I, I know that there's um, a, a small area of wetland that um, is going to be covered by the um, parking lot. That's like right at the end of the driveway. You know, we talked about it on Saturday. Um, and you were going to, um, um, I can't remember the right term, but okay. basically build a little wetland, you know, to replace that. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm just wondering where, I don't see that on the plans where that's, um, where that's depicted. Um, I, see, I see the wetlands that you're covering up, but I don't see and maybe I'm looking at the wrong page, but I'm looking at the same one that you had up earlier. Um, sure. um, if I can share my screen again, I, I'll, I will show you. Thank um, you. Yep, and that's something that we're currently reviewing with the Conservation Commission. Um, okay. So let's see. So is that screen showing up now? Yep. Okay. <clears throat> so I, I think we're we're filling a section of um, wetland for the for the crossing right in right in here. Um, there's also just an isolated um, wetland yeah. over here. The mitigation area that was chosen was located right right here. Um, essentially, you want to have the mitigation be in an area that. Uh, is abutting the, the the wetland itself, so you just increase the increase the habitat. Um, but it's going to be in this location right over here is where a consultant felt as though that made the most sense. Okay, so when we were on the site walk, that would have been past the fence of the retention basin that's right by the road. So the the basin by the road is is located here. Yep, and we walked up to the end of the fence someplace uh, along the road there, so that's probably yep, yeah, probably around that. there. So it's a yeah. little bit to the right of there. Okay, and I did not see that on the plans that we have. I don't have that <laughs> that particular one, that page that you're showing, but the plans that we have, um, I didn't see that depicted. And I just, you know, just wanted to make sure that it's, <clears throat> you know, it's it's shown appropriately. But I see. Um, page C601, it seems like that might be, that might be shown on there. So now that I, I know what I'm looking for, yep. it appears to be shown there. Okay. And obviously, you know, if, if any of this affects the, the way that, um, 
the calculations are done, you know, that you were just talking about with Phil, um, you know, I want to make sure that that's uh, accurately represented as well. Thanks. Yeah, no, I mean, if anything, thank you. If anything, that creates additional storage within the wetland area. Okay. You good, Mary? Okay. So we've got a lot of uh, site plan standards. Um, and Mr. Gelsich, should would you, is it your recommendation that we go through each one of these? And I, I think maybe I can probably even paraphrase if necessary. That is one way to do it. Uh, I believe Beta also went through this in their letter. So if there's any uh, outstanding items in there, that's something that could, could be done. Uh, I like that better because there's a lot of them and... Uh... Sorry, I accidentally muted you. Meant to mute myself. <laughs> All right, I'm back. Uh, yeah, I, I like that uh, approach a lot better. Um, so, Mr. Paradis, um, were there any particular site plan standards um, that you felt um, present that, that warrant um, some further discussion on uh, our part? Uh, am, I mute, am I muted? No, oh, you're on. We can hear you. Okay. Um, I just, uh, so they provided a response. Uh, they dealt with the majority of the issues. Um, I'm looking through the letter right now. Uh, Obviously, we want uh, access for the fire vehicles. Um, I don't think it's a problem. Um, I think the fire department needs just need to make sure that they're comfortable with it. Um, there are so so a lot of questions re are related to what the final tenant may be. Uh, um, so it's hard to figure out exactly. You know, for instance would be impacted or or other things i mean i don't think it's substantial um the differences between what uh, what they're shown and what may be proposed um so the there you know the lighting issue is you know they don't have a complete completed lighting plan because they don't know exactly again what what their tenant's going to need um they provided some parking lot lighted and, and obviously it's isolated and they conform to the 15 foot height and all that kind of stuff so uh, again that's not a it's not a major issue um just some minor things relative to the it looks like they addressed that um excess snow they don't have a lot of whole lot of snow storage on site um so they're going to have to provide some sort of, you know, if we get a storm like we just did, they're going to have to find some, some way to manage that snow. Um, so, other other than that, I don't think there's a whole lot of, lot of outstanding issues. All right. So, so a couple of quick questions. Um, one, um, maybe this is to Mr. Gelsich. Um, given that they don't have a tenant and there's still some design components that are not yet finalized. Um, I'm wondering if you have recommendations on how we assess these site plan standards, um, you know, in a general sense, um, given that they, they don't have all of these details worked out yet, or if there's any precedence for how we review this kind of thing. So in terms of site plan standards, I think the only issue that comes up, and I, I could be wrong, but I think the only issue that comes up is parking. Um, that's what gets changed by the tenant that's in place. Uh, in terms of site plan. Um, and I believe, let's see, what did we, we wrote it up as something. Required parking for the use, which is classified as general office, medical and dental office, research and development and industrial uses uh, is 1,000 square feet of GFA, uh, is, is one space per 1,000 square feet of GFA. Sorry, three spaces per 1,000 square feet of GFA. So that means they're required to put 98 spaces. They're providing 106. Um, so I don't really know what use would change that would be more intensive in terms of parking. Um, if you're looking at the general office space, 
that's requiring three per 1,000. Anything that's less intensive, even if it's an industrial use, is going to have fewer parking spaces required. So um, it would be helpful to know the type of use, but I don't know if it's really going to impact the site design in terms of parking. Phil, is there another issue that I'm, I'm missing that would be uh, relevant to the type of use? Um, maybe traffic, but again, I don't, I don't know if it'd be huge uh, in that area, so. Okay. Um, and then the other things you had mentioned, Phil, one was uh, fire access and is Chief Slammon still on? Looks like he is not. That he was on earlier. Um, and then snow removal, Phil, you mentioned that uh, if we had a storm like the one we just had, and that, at least my experience, the one we just had wasn't really that big. So if, if that type of storm would be problematic for this site, then I guess my question to the applicant would be, um, you know, how much assessment analysis have you done for snow storage? Um, and is there an opportunity to provide a little bit more thought into how that snow is managed on the site? I, I think, honestly, I, I think we're, we're, we're fine with that. Um, we, we don't have an issue if, you know, if we don't have enough room on site to, to take it, to take it off the site. Um, but I do feel as though we've, we've, we've got enough, um, enough area. Uh, in, in particular, we do have some extra parking stalls that, that are above and beyond what would be required from, um, um, from a zoning standpoint. We could put them in that area, but but again, if we ever got a storm that was that was too great, we, we don't have a concern with the condition to to take them off site. Um, I, I think in reality, I don't think that's going to be a, a big concern though. Okay. Um, and I, I know we're uh, we're up on our thirty minute slot. Um, I think what makes sense is maybe um, we'll just open it up quickly and see if people have. Um, specific questions or comments on the site plan standards. Looks like, chair, yes, I, go ahead, Frank. I, I, I don't, I don't, you know, going through some of the conditions and standards, I don't see any issues. I think the one outstanding, and you've addressed it earlier, Mr. Chairman, is just getting alignment between beta and the applicant on um, some of the stormwater data that, um, that they were looking for to, to satisfy their the question. I would agree. Thank you, Fran. Okay. Any comments or questions from the public? If anybody on the, from the public is uh, is on. Okay. So so then uh, what I'm going to recommend for next steps um, is that uh, the applicant work with Beta to close out those remaining issues in particular around stormwater. Um, I also think it'd be great. Um, I don't think I saw a, uh, a letter or confirmation from the fire department, but uh, it'd be helpful to us just to have uh, some type of confirmation that the fire chief is, is comfortable with access on this. Um, and then when we reconvene, uh, we can go straight to discussion on the waivers um, and, and hopefully get through this um, pretty quickly. But I, I do think we need to resolve those um, remaining overtimes with, with beta. Make sense? Okay, so, so I will um, then entertain a motion to continue this public hearing um, to January 4th. 2021. So moved. Sundar, you're muted. So moved. All right. And, Rob uh, Benson, second. Thank you, guys. Uh, and assuming no further discussion, we will vote on uh, continuing this hearing. So, Rob? Rob Benson, yes. Uh, Jane? Jane Marin, yes. Dave? Dave Paul, yes. Mary? Mary Larson Marlowe, yes. Deb? Deb Feinberg, yes. Sundar? Linda Subraman, yes. Fran? Fran Young, yes. And Gary Trundles, yes. Uh, so uh, we will see you uh, next year.
Thank you, uh, <laughs> thank you, John. Thank you, Kathy. Thank you all. Have a great holiday. Thank you. You, you as well. well. Thank you, everybody. All right. Um, so our last hearing for this evening is uh, 146 East Main Street. And flipping through a lot of pages here. I must have missed it. Um, can the applicants identify themselves? Hello, good evening, Mr. Chair, members of the board. My name is Cheryl Guillermo, and I'm a project manager at Dupree Engineering with offices at 990 Washington Street in Dedham. I'm also here with the applicant, uh, Dan DeFrida from Plankton Energy. Uh, there he is. All right. Hey, guys. Thank you. Uh, thank you both for your patience. As, uh, I'm sure there's nothing better you'd love to do on a Monday night in December than uh, <laughs> listen to other hearings, but um, <laughs> we appreciate your, your patience. Um, so, and again, given that it's already late, um, I do want to make sure we get through appropriate introduction here um, and staff report. And I, um, like most of these projects, um, well, we'll open it up and see if people would like to do a site walk. Um, may, well, we can get to that. But um, to start, um, if, uh, if the applicant wouldn't mind um, giving us a uh, brief um, project introduction. Is it possible to share my screen? Yes, it is. And um, Mr. Gelsich will be able to give you permission to, to share. Awesome. Thank you. Share the right screen here. Can everybody see this? Almost. Uh, yes. Okay, great. So the application before you tonight is a canopy solar project located on land owned by the First Congregational Church of Hopkinton. It's known to you guys probably as uh, Faith Community Church. It's located at 146 East Main Street. It's on the north side of the Hopkinton Ashland line. Uh, the church is seen here in the middle. The eastern portion of the site is predominantly wetlands and wooded. There's also wetland resource areas and uh, vegetation along the eastern border buffering the residences. Uh, the area is zone residence B. And let me just switch over my right. The focus on this application is gonna be in the rear parking area, um, as you can see right here. It's a little bit easier to see on the aerial than it is on the site plan. So the church is up here in the front. Uh, East Main Street is along the top. And these blue outlines shown are the six uh, canopy structures. We're calling them carports. Um, those are going to be located over the existing parking spaces. There's going to be no change in the existing um, parking count or configuration. I believe we're around 381 spaces and the plan is to keep all of those spaces. Just for a point of reference, uh, the existing curb line, you follow my cursor here, comes down along the side, down to the bottom of the page. So our first set of canopies is on the second row of parking spaces. So the canopies themselves are uh, lowest structural members, about 13 and a half feet from the ground. These canopies are super elevated. There are, are other canopies that you may have seen that um, you know, kind of a V shape or have a different angle. So one side of these is 13 and a half feet clear. And on the opposite side, you have 18 and a half feet or so. Um, to this point, and then the highest point is about 22 feet, a little less than 22 feet. These blue circles, or sorry, dark black circles that you can see are the columns. Uh, these canopies will be mounted to the columns, and that's really the only disturbance that, that you'll see. These canopies are elevated above the ground, and we have a picture of an actual installation uh, for reference. Um, this is one of uh, Plankton Energy's other facilities. 
The location of the canopies is going to be uh, require the removal of two of the existing light poles. There's one existing light pole in the center of the page and another one under carport four. Um, because the canopies you know, will provide some parking shade, we are proposing um, LED lighting that will mount to the underside of the canopies. And then there's also some areas under the canopies where landscaping will need to be removed. So this happens under carport four, five, and six. So if we switch back over here, uh, these are the areas of vegetation that will uh, need to be removed. So the plan is to put some kind of drought tolerant grass or a crushed stone underneath those. Back over. So all of these have been cited to um, avoid uh, interference with any of the existing utilities. Um, and the septic system uh, and the drainage system will also not be impacted. Uh, Stormwater patterns on our site will remain the same. Um, we're not planning to channelize or provide gutters for any of these. The canopies themselves are spaced out on the structure. So stormwater that hits these, these canopy surfaces will be allowed to pass through, hit the pavement, and go to the catch basins that they currently do today. The interconnections of the grid. So there is an existing transformer up at the front of the site. Again, East Main Street. This is the main church building. So we're proposing to do an underground cable from the existing transformer down along the back of the curb line to a new step up transformer, to at which point it will tie into the proposed canopies. The proposed work itself for these canopies um, is very minimal. It involves the uh, coring of the column footings into the spine of the parking spaces, um, construction of the columns and footings in the existing parking area, installation of the solar panels on the frame supported by the columns, installation of the light fixtures, uh, and the trenching and equipment. Because we are within the uh, wetland buffers, we have submitted an application to the Conservation Commission and we are scheduled for tomorrow night. Uh, so that is all I have. I'm happy to answer any questions. Um, Dan, um, if you could just give a little overview of um, where you're at in the process and a little bit about uh, Plankton Energy, that would be great. Yeah, thanks Cheryl. Um, so I guess just a little, a little bit more big picture for everyone. Um, this project, we are working in tandem to develop this project with, with the church. Um, the church is both going to financially benefit from lease payments from Plankton Energy. We will be the owner of the system, and they're also going to benefit from energy credits from the system that will allow them to, to save money on their electric bill. Um, the remaining energy that the church is not purchasing um, will be sold through the Massachusetts low-income community solar program. So we'll be selling the energy at discounted prices to low-income customers in the greater Hopkinton and greater Boston area. Um, in terms of where we're at in the process at this point, we are um, assuming everything goes well tonight and tomorrow. Uh, we are estimating um, to be able to hopefully commence construction and installation on this in mid to most likely late March uh, with a completion in um, uh, late June, early July. Um, we are concurrently along with this in the process of finalizing our, our approvals from Eversource Energy, which is the local electric utility. And we expect to have those final approvals from them uh, in, in the next, in, in the next uh, three to four weeks um, by, by mid to late January. Um, so thank you, thank you again for all sticking around, and you know I'm, I welcome welcome any of your any of your questions. Okay, and let's hold off on questions quite yet, but um, I do. If it's okay, let's move forward to the staff report. So, uh, Mr. Gelsich, if you want to kind of walk us through your uh, initial assessments of the proposal, and you're muted, John. Sorry about that. Um, so this is uh, one of the first that I've seen come across uh, the planning board's table for an accessory solar. Usually it's a commercial solar. So this one is a little different in scope. Um, 
it appears to not have uh, a lot of impacts on the development since it's already a constructed parking lot. As the applicant said, this the stormwater patterns likely aren't going to change. Um, this is a minor site plan because it is, uh, let me bring up the actual language. It is uh, substantially visible from public or private street or public place, requires a building yeah. permit, as well as the alteration of a parking area containing more than five parking spaces. I think, I think the parking area uh, piece is critical because they are altering um, a parking area containing more than five spaces, but they're not proposing to reduce the capacity of that parking area. So uh, while they're altering it, they're not actually changing the parking area uh, detrimentally. So I think that's, uh, that's a plus in their book. Um, other than that, it's it seems like it satisfies the site plan standards. Um, we did not have beta review this because it was a minor site plan that appeared to have minimal stormwater, if minimal, if any stormwater issues um, and any other engineering issues. Uh, we did bring this up to the fire department prior to their submission. Fire department asked for a truck turning plan, which I believe is in the uh, folder, the shared folder, and they did not raise any other issues once they received that plan. So uh, I understand that that is okay with the fire department. They, they just want to make sure they could get access to the parking spaces at the far end of the lot, which I believe they can. Uh, the the uh, canopies will not hinder the trucks from making those turns. All right, and uh, sorry, go ahead, John. Nope, and that's all I have. Yeah, and I think the other uh, other departments did not have any comments or concerns related to this. Board of Health had comments, but they were more of kind of general Board of Health comments. Yeah, okay. All right, thanks, John. Um, so just as we move forward through the public hearing outline, um, you know, sometimes in these situations, we would do a site walk um, I, you know, I don't know how people feel about that. For me, I, I've been in that parking lot and it seems pretty <laughs> straightforward, um, but I'll see if people on the board feel like a site walk would be warranted. I see a thumbs down. Not yeah, necessarily. Chair, I'm, I'm very okay. familiar with this property. The, the Boy Scouts meeting happens uh, in yep. this church. So uh, I've, I've seen this parking lot uh, many times. Okay. Great. So no site walk. And again, I think it's just in the interest of this being a, a uh, minor project site plan review uh, and hopefully being re relatively straightforward. I think we're good there. Um, detailed discussion on the decision criteria. So again, conformance with um, site plan standards. Um, and in this situation, in the last time we had uh, beta review these, um, and since we don't have beta to review those, um, John, are you recommending that I quickly go through each of these? I think that would be best, yes. Okay. And um, I'm gonna read through them quickly. And again, I, I'd encourage if people have a question or comment to speak up. There are quite a few of them. Um, I'm gonna be, uh, you know, I, I might or may not provide some comments and to the applicant as well. Um, if we need to pause, please just um, just speak up. Sound good? Okay. Yeah. So site disturbance in wetland buffer zones and to slope and slopes. Uh, sorry, and to slopes in excess of 25% shall be minimized. I don't think that's an issue because I don't think there are any 25% slopes in a parking lot. Um, unique and natural historic features shall be preserved whenever feasible. Uh, and the use of uh, 210.117.2 lots with historic structures shall be considered as a mechanism to do so where appropriate. Um, again, uh, no natural and historic features. Uh, tree, vegetation, tree vegetation and soil removal shall be minimized. Um, you already outlined there's a, a, few, a few spots um, you'll be removing some vegetation, but I just have one question on that. Is that existing vegetation, is that purely um, uh, cosmetic or does it serve any, any function, um, you know, in terms of drainage, absorption, uh, permeability, anything, anything like that? The existing or the proposed? No, the, the existing vegetation that's being removed. Uh, it, it looks to us based on the plans that we have reviewed from 
the original submission that it is just aesthetic, parking lot, trees, for shading purposes. Okay. And okay. Uh, any other comments or questions from the board on that one? If not, we'll move forward. Uh, site activities shown in the site plan shall be screened from view from abutting properties and residential use. Uh, methods of screening may include solid fencing, landscaping, or other proposals of the applicant, subject to review by the view by the planning board. I just have one uh, question regarding that. Um, it appears from the plans that there's, and and my recollection of the site is that you know the the parking lot is kind of in a in a valley and um, it slopes up toward the abutters on the western side and possibly the ones um, toward you know that are that are uh, along East Main Street too um, and. Um, you know, again, I'm, I'm familiar with uh, uh, these canopy type um, uh, constructions and um, and they're generally not visible. It's generally, you know, not, they're not slanted very much. They're generally not visible, um, uh, the, the panels themselves. Um, but will they be, and have you done any, you know, checking of the sight lines from any abutting um, properties? Um, to, especially to the west, it looks like those are the nearest and possibly the highest um, houses nearby. It's, that's a great question. Up at East Main Street, the elevation is at 326. Mm -hmm. And then as you approach the back of the church, the elevation starts to drop um, 314, 312, and it keeps going. Um, we did take some photos that I'd be happy to share with you from the street. Um, it is pretty wooded at the front. Um, just share one more time here. So where am I? Just bear with me one second. So this is the street view uh, from Cross Street, which is directly um, across from the site. So you can see the church in the background there. And then we have some other photos. Um, this is if you were standing along the street looking to the back. Uh, the canopies would be behind you know, this area. Then on the left side, looking <coughs> Main Street into the site, you, know, you really can't see much. Um, but to answer the second part of your question in the back, um, so this is looking at those abutters. So it is fairly wooded, even though you know, the leaves have fallen from the trees. Um, same here. And then if we look back at the existing conditions plan, um, down in our parking lot, we're at 306. Um, and it does start sloping up, but you're still probably around the same elevation back for these adjacent abutters. But with the, the trees um, provide a pretty good buffer from the canopies. Okay. Okay, good. Um, this is definitely the kind of solar development we'd like to see. <laughs> um, and that's, it's great. Um, so um, I'm all for this. I just wanna make sure that we aren't missing any sight line issues for the abutters. <laughs> Mary. To yeah. add on to that, we talked to one of the abutters today. I forget his last name, his name was Brent and he was speaking in favor of the project. And he did say that he has you can see the parking lot, but it's, you know, it's mostly shaded by all the trees and he had no concern. So it was reassuring to, to hear somebody that actually lives there say that. Good. All right, so we'll keep moving forward. Uh, I think as you noted, but if you just want to confirm all utilities will be underground. I'll save you a question from Mr. Paul by just answering and confirming that. Yeah, so I, I did actually have a follow up with that because she said something about a step up <coughs> from the underground after to go to the um, canopies. Is that true? They're going to be a new. I think she said a step up transformer. Yeah, so what does that mean? But uh, Cheryl, if you can just confirm, um, will all the utilities be underground for this application? Yes, that is what we we're proposing. Great, thank you. Um, Exposed storage areas, machinery, service areas, truck loading areas, utility buildings and structures and other similar uses shall be visually screened from the abutting properties and those using public ways. 
Um, so are the, the step up transformer and the other equipment, is that, uh, I don't recall seeing details on the screening for, for that. Is that all screened? Yep, so we have a note that we're gonna screen the transformers with shrubs, some kind of arborvitae or some, some small um, bushes around those. Okay. Uh, any questions about that? I know how this group loves uh, our providers. <laughs> um, <laughs> as, a, as a minor slight plan review, I don't know if we want to get into that detail, but I'll open up to the board and see if people have specific questions around that screening. If not, I will move on. Uh, site plan shall measure, shall show measures to reduce and abate noise and odors generated from the site that will impact surrounding properties and um, as I'm aware, the, the noise, well, I'll leave it at that because I know sometimes these transformers can make some noise, but um, the applicant, do you have any information or data on the noise volume that could be produced by said equipment? There won't be any, um, any, any audible noise from the transformer or from the systems itself. Okay. Uh, site plan shall maximize the convenience and safety of vehicular and pedestrian movement within the site and to and from adjacent public ways of supporting documentation such as traffic or parking studies submitted to the planning board indicates the vehicular, vehicular and pedestrian traffic movement depicted on the site plan. The proposed application will have a significant negative impact or impacts on the site uh, or within the adjacent ways. Such impact shall be mitigated by the applicant. I don't think that's an issue. Uh, parking areas shall be designed so they are safe and convenient and do not detract from the use and enjoyment of proposed structures. And that seems pretty self-explanatory. Um, parking areas, uh, let's see, the site plan shall minimize the number of curb cuts on public ways. No changes there. Uh, driveways shall be designed to ensure safe site distances at interior and exterior intersections and along driveways in accordance with applicable AASHTO requirements. And I'm assuming no change in site uh, distances. Sidewalks shall be provided along the entire frontage of the subject property uh, along existing public ways. Um, I think there is a, is there a sidewalk there? Uh, either way, I'm not sure that's relevant to this application, but. Uh, levels of illumination shall be provided as follows. No property may have exterior lighting that exceeds the average illumination level recommendation by the Illuminating Engineer Society of North America for such use as set forth in lighting facilities for parking facilities. Uh, the Lighting Handbook, 10th edition, Illuminating Engineering Society, 2011. And I'll just uh, look to the applicant quickly to, make sh to ask that they conform. Sometimes this group has lighting questions but I think you already explained that you're replacing some poles with um, downward LEDs underneath the canopy. So that seems to that's, be that's correct. our uh, preferences. Um, Through the chair. Yes. I would just like to confirm that whatever the rules that the church follows right now for their outdoor lighting, you know, turning off by such and such a time at night or whatever the case may be, that they'll be able to have control of the LEDs that are underneath the canopies as well to in, in order to, yeah, okay. They, they, they will, it'll be, it'll be up to the, the church's discretion to set the timer uh, on the lights so that they'll have the timer. Good, thank you. Yep. All right, for pole mounted lights, uh, there aren't any pole mounted lights. Um, so that one doesn't apply. Pedestrian area lighting shall utilize full shielded fixtures and the height of light source shall not exceed 12 feet measured from the ground uh, at the base of the pole to the bottom of the fixture. Uh, that one's interesting because it sounds like the design, they would be slightly higher than 12 feet, but because they're under a canopy, um, me personally, that's not a concern, but uh, any thoughts on that from the board? Nope. Okay. Um, no exterior lighting may interfere with the safe movement of motor vehicles on public ways or private ways open to the public. Uh, mercury vapor lights, uh, mercury vapor lamps shall be prohibited. Uh, uplighting shall be permitted only when used in one of the following manners. Um, there is no uplighting. So that one should be pretty self-explanatory. Uh, flood lighting shall be permitted only if a fully shielded fixture is utilized and no lighting will fall 
onto the property of others. Um, just to confirm, those LED downlights are those floodlights? I do not believe so. Um, we have zero foot candles pretty much right outside of the existing curb line. Uh, okay. I can I can confirm that. I don't. I'm not positive yeah. on that. And I'm, I'm not too concerned about it because they're all sort of inward from not only the property line but the parking lot as well. But yeah, and the average you're... foot candle of these is 0.77 okay. um, under the canopy. Um, safety and security lighting shall use motion sensors, photo cells, or photo cells or timers to control duration of nighttime illumination. You already commented that these would be on timers. Um, exterior lighting of recreation facilities shall utilize fully shielded fixtures. Um, this is not a recreation facility, so I think we're okay there. Uh, actually, is this a right? I guess it's a parking. It's a parking lot for something that is used as a recreation facility. I'm not sure we need to debate that, but if there's any issues or concerns, please speak up. Uh, blinking, flashing, moving, revolving, and flickering lights, as well as lighting that changes intensity or color, shall be prohibited. Uh, notwithstanding any provisions of the subsection in the contrary, sidewalks that run along the perimeter of a site and are in public right of way or abutting properties may be illuminated. Um, and then exterior lighting that does not conform to the provisions of the subsection may be allowed by special permit from the planning board. If the planning board finds that such exterior lighting will be consistent with the purposes of this article or that there are other demonstrable community health, safety, or welfare benefits that will be served by the exterior lighting. That's pretty straightforward. Uh, adequate access shall be provided to each structure for emergency and vehicles and personnel. Uh, they've got full access all around them. Uh, the site plan shall conform to applicable mass Department of Environmental Protection stormwater management regulations. Uh, the site plan shall, shall show adequate measures to prevent pollution of surface water and groundwater to minimize erosion and sedimentation and to prevent changes in the potential for flooding. Stormwater management facilities shall be designed so that neighboring properties, public ways, and public storm drainage systems will not be adversely impacted. Uh, I think the applicant already described the, how these uh, will not impact uh, stormwater management. Uh, mechanical equipment or other utility hardware on the roof, grounds, uh, or buildings shall be screened uh, from view from the ground. Um, I think the only mechanical equipment, if it's even considered mechanical equipment, would be the, the step up transformer. Um, I don't have any concerns here. And then the last one, which I don't think is relevant, is all dumpsters shall be screened from public view. Um, I know I said 30 minutes. I'm going to propose that we move on unless I see any objections. Any other questions on the site plan standards? Yes, sir, the chair. Gary. Go ahead, Dave. Yeah, just um, I just wanted to get some. Uh, I didn't get a chance to ask about the overall size of this. Like, uh, how many megawatts is it, and how many? What's the number of panels? It'll be, yeah, it'll be six hundred and ninety-six kilowatts uh, of direct current. Let me do the math because off the top of my head, I should know this, but I forgot the exact what are, number of modules. Four hundred kilowatts or. 350. The, the module, each module is is, is um, 400 watts uh, modules. It's 696 kilowatts is the total output of the system. It's 1,740 solar panels. Great, thank you. Uh -huh. OK, any other, any further questions um, either on the site plan standards or other comments? And seeing none. Um, uh, are there any waiver requests? No, no requested waivers. <laughs> That's an easy discussion. <laughs> um, review of the decision criteria. I'm cooking around a little bit in my outline here. 
So again, I, I think this is relatively straightforward. Um, planning board shall issue a decision of site plan review in one of the following forms, uh, a written approval of the application subject to any reasonable conditions, modifications and, re and restrictions related to the site plan standards contained in section 210.136.1. Uh, um, planning board should review the application for site plan approval with regards to conformance to site plan standards, which we've already gone through. If all standards are met, it is to be assumed that the board shall grant approval of the site plan with conditions related to the site plan standards as applicable. Any questions or comments on the decision criteria? Uh, and it sounds like uh, no further plan revisions to be made. Um, and in terms of Findings. Um, the proposed findings would be that the board finds that the proposed development conforms to the site plan standards and provisions of Article 20, and that all applicable criteria and standards set forth in the zoning bylaws, Chapter 210, have been satisfied. So, again, I, any other findings that people would want to add or consider? All right. Um, we're good there. Um, we've got, uh, again, a number of conditions that I do need to read aloud. So what I'd like to do here is I'm going to read through these conditions. Um, if people have other conditions that they think we should consider adding, um, now is a great time to take a moment to jot those down. Um, after we go through those conditions, then we will go ahead and um, vote on the findings and conditions uh, as discussed. So proposed conditions. Um, number one, the director of municipal inspections inspects projects under construction for compliance with the approved decision of site plan review. This includes the driveway, roadway, and infrastructure construction shown in the plan. If the director of municipal inspections determines at any time before or during construction that a registered professional engineer or other such outside professional is required to assist with the inspections, the stormwater management system or any other components of the site plan, the applicant shall be responsible for the cost of those inspections. Two, all construction activities shall adhere to the applicable local, state, and federal laws and regulations regarding noise, vibration, dust, sedimentation, and the use of interference, use of interference with or blocking of town roads. Three, the applicant shall be responsible for mitigating all construction related impacts, including erosion, siltation, and dust control. The applicant shall maintain all portions of any public way used for construction access free of soil, mud, or debris deposited due to the use by construction vehicles associated with the project and shall regularly sweep such areas as directed by the director of municipal inspections and consultation in consultation with the DPW director. Four, the applicant shall regularly remove construction trash and debris from the site in accordance with good construction practice and the construction management plan. No tree stumps, demolition material, trash or debris shall be burned or buried on the site. Number five, all ex exterior lighting within the development project, whether shown on the approved site plan or required by mass state building code, shall be shielded, directed downward, and not upward or outward. It shall not spill onto adjacent property. Mr. Chair? Yes, sir. I would recommend uh, number six being struck. Okay. Uh, performance guarantee. Does anybody object to striking uh, a performance guarantee? So it's just a question, the, the rationale, John, for striking it? Uh, so this is an accessory use on an already constructed property. Um, and, and so the performance guarantee is basically if the town needs to fix up whatever construction has been done, and this would be on private property, so the town really wouldn't go onto the parking lot to fix it up, it would be the responsibility of the church. Somewhat related question for the chair. Go ahead, Dave. I'm sure John will educate us and has this covered, but where do we see, how do, how do we handle the, um, the amount set aside for uh, disassembling down the road, decommissioning? Um, that's a good question. Uh, again, since it's, it's an accessory use, um, it's really gonna be incumbent upon the church to deal with it. It's on their property. It's not, it's not the case of a commercial solar where whoever leaves, it's just an abandoned site. If they leave the the solar panels on site, it's still gonna be used as a church presumptively. So 
the church is going to be uh, responsible for removing it from their site once it's once it's decommissioned. It's not going to be an abandoned site like a commercial solar site would be. Great, thank you. The other way to look at it is they've still got some incentive to manage the site appropriately, whereas with a primary use, somebody can walk away and there's no no financial reason for them to to clean it up. So how do people feel about striking condition six? Thumbs up, thumbs up, thumbs up. Fran? Fran's either frozen or is not moving. I'm not sure which one. Okay. So let's uh, let's strike condition six, and uh, if we need to, we can come back to that. Um, number seven: If construction has not commenced within three years of the date of filing of the site plan decision with the town clerk, approval shall be automatically rescinded unless such time is extended by the board. For the purpose of this condition, the term "commenced" shall mean the commencement of site work. Eight, a signed construction management plan shall be submitted to the planning board prior to the commencement of any site work. The applicant shall also submit a revised full site plan set, which incorporates all the modifications made during the public hearing process and any required in this decision. Fran, welcome back. Uh, number nine, erosion and sedimentation control measures shall be implemented during the construction period in accordance with the approved site plan and the construction management plan. If they are found to be inadequate, the applicant shall immediately correct any deficiencies. Number 10, the planning board shall receive a sign off confirming that the site contractor and any major subcontractors have received the construction management plan prior to the commencement of any site work. Number 11, construction may occur only between the hours of 7 a.m. and 7 p.m. Monday through Friday and Saturdays between 8 a.m. and 4 p.m. pursuant to Chapter 141, Article I of the Town of Hopkinton General Bylaws. 12, the applicant shall submit final as built plans to the planning board prior to the issuance of a certificate of occupancy. 13, the applicant developer shall provide the principal planner with a project point of contact and contact information prior to the issuance of a building permit. The point of contact information shall be kept current throughout correspondence to principal planner until the final certificate, certif certificate of occupancy is issued or construction is otherwise considered complete. Um, so uh, I know that we lost Mr. DeYoung there. Um, and Fran, I didn't know if you had any further comments or thoughts on um, striking the... Um, the uh, performance guarantee associated with this. Uh, I'm sorry about that. Uh, some of the internet challenges, Mr. Chairman. No, I thought Mr. Gelsich did a nice job of explaining and I'm uh, comfortable as long as the other board members are as well of waiving that um, provision in number six. Okay. Um, any further comments or questions on those proposed conditions? I guess my real question is, is there anything else that we're missing that would be applicable here? And I guess my my only question, and I, I hear Mr. I hear Mr. Gelsich's point on not having a performance bond of some kind for removal. Um, would there be any value of addressing uh, as the whole decommissioning concept? Still, sort of, just wondering if we should consider addressing that in some other means and. You know, I'm not I'm not quite sure because I, I realize this is accessory, but um, any thoughts on that from the group? Not necessary. I don't think it's necessary. Jane, um, the church already has multiple solar panels on their existing mm -hmm. building. I would assume that it would fall under the same kind of a plan that they yeah. already have. That's a great point, Jane. Okay. Um, is there any public comments on this? <clears throat> um, okay. So at this point, um, I know that it says uh, close the public hearing. Um, but again, I'm going to recommend that we just hold tight on that and actually um, vote on the permits being requested first, just to make sure we get through everything. So, uh, I will entertain 
A motion that the board finds the proposed development conforms to the site plan standards and provisions of Article 20, and that all applicable criteria and standards set forth in the zoning bylaws have been satisfied. So moved. Rob Benson, so moved. So Rob with the motion. Sundar, is there a second? Oh, somebody already said that, but Sundar Sivaraman seconded. Oh, no one seconded it. Uh, there were two motions and you seconded <laughs> That's it. true. <laughs> uh, in light of no further discussion, we'll take a vote. Uh, Rob? Rob Benson, yes. Jane? Jane Marin, yes. Dave? Dave Paul, yes. Mary? Mary Larson Marlowe, yes. Deb? Deb Refine Blue, yes, and Godspeed. Sudar? Mr. Subraman, yes. Fran? Fran Young, yes. And Gary Trendle is a yes. Motion carries. Um, and then, uh, and then I will entertain a motion that the board grant approval of the site plan under Article 20 of the zoning bylaws, um, granting, uh, well, there are no waivers requested and subject to the conditions uh, as read aloud uh, by myself. So moved. Seconded. Dave, you're not following your own process. I know, exactly. <laughs> you specified that Mr. Benson should make the motion but he didn't, well, he didn't jump. He, he's, get, he's, get, he, he's getting <laughs> anxious. He's getting anxious. He's feeling the, the, near, the end is near. It's a great All right, so we have a motion. We have a second. Uh, I'm assuming there's no further discussion. We will move to a vote. Uh, Rob? Rob Benson, yes. Jane? Jane, yes. Dave? Dave Ball, yes. Mary? Mary Larson Marlowe, yes. Deb? Deb Feinberg, yes. Sundar? Sundar Sivaraman, yes. Fran? Fran Young, yes. And Gary Trendle is a yes. So congratulations. Uh, that uh, minor project site plan review is approved. Um, so thank you to the applicant. We're just going to go ahead and we do have to vote on closing the hearing. So I'll entertain a motion to close this public hearing. Rob, we are waiting for you. Rob Benson, so moved. <laughs> so Ms. Sivraman seconded. All right. And uh, assuming no further discussion, we'll vote. Rob? Rob Benson, yes. Jane? Jane Marin, yes. Dave? Dave Paul, I just want to say that it's great to see a uh, solar farm where there's no trees <clears throat> down. Yes. <laughs> Mary? Mary Larson Marlowe, yes. Deb? Deb Refinery did yes. Sundar? From the Sivraman, yes. Fran? And Young, yes. And Gary Trindle is yes with a minor correction to Mr. Paul because there are a few trees being cut down. <laughs> but, okay with um, applicant, uh, um, we, uh, oh, are there any, oh, there we, uh, yeah, sorry. Uh, Cheryl and Dan, thank you. Appreciate your patience tonight. Um, and uh, Rob, you know, someday you get a few more hearings under your belt. Maybe you can help them move along as smoothly as this one did. So, yeah. I think I think that was. Uh, I think the other hearing was a strategic move by Gary. He had the foresight to notice know what was coming. I was going to say, Gary, I could even do that one. <laughs> so through the chair, uh, through the chair, maybe maybe this this project should become a model for our um, Zach meetings. The whole solar thing, we can Absolutely. say. Yeah, we can say. Yeah. Yeah. Only, we can it. <laughs> to to, to <laughs> Mary's <laughs> earlier comments, uh, this is the kind of solar that we want to see in town, and uh, you know, and I think these are these are, um, yeah. I'll and I think there are there are a lot of properties which probably qualify for the same kind of canopy kind of a setup. So. And, and, and as Mr. You know, um, Gilfrida said, 600 plus kilowatts is a, not an insignificant amount of uh, power, given that our, you know, we just discussed something which is 2.4 megawatts. So you know, these things can build up and you can get you know, multiple uh, megawatts right out of that. So. so you should start knocking on some doors, encourage people. Def we, definitely, definitely. <laughs> All right, so it is, uh, thank you, it is late. <laughs> Thank you. Um, it is uh, the end of December, uh, our last meeting of 2020. So um, I will entertain a motion to adjourn the meeting. Rob Benson, so moved. Professor so Raman seconded. And uh, assuming no further discussion, Mr. Benson, how do you? Oh, 
Rob Benson, yes. Oh, hang on. Sorry, discussion from our chair, I mean, from our planner, Mr. Gelsich. Not necessarily about the vote, but um, I just want to remind you, I'm going to be in the office tomorrow. We have an a &R to sign. Uh, Gary, I'm going to have a decision for you to sign. And Rob, could you come in and please sign the Chamberlain decision since Gary recused himself from that? What time are you going to be there, John? Nine to four. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I'll, I uh, I will find a time. I'll be there. So if Rob and Gary can come in, then we need three other signatures for the A and R, please. I can make it. Perfect. Just give me a heads up when you come in, and I can meet you at the front door. All right, Mr. Chair. Thank you, John. Uh, Mr. Benson, how do you vote? Rob Benson, yes. Uh, Jane. Jane Marin, yes. Dave. Dave Paul, yes. Mary. Mary Larson Marlowe, yes. And there's still a Zach meeting during 2020, so you can all come on Monday night. <laughs> Thank you, Mary. I appreciate you pushing through to get some clarity on our commercial solar bylaws um, as soon as possible. Uh, Deb? Yeah, Mary deserves a gold star. She, she's been patient and thorough. Um, anyway, yes, um, Deborah Feinbrew, yes, and everybody have a wonderful holiday, and maybe 2021 will be a little bit different and we can meet in person. Uh, that would be fun, um, uh, in person beside the site walk, because we have done that. Uh, Sundar? True. Sundar True. Subraman, yes. Fran? Fran Young, yes. And Gary Trendle is a yes. So happy holidays, happy new year, and... Uh, Looking forward to putting this year behind us. So thanks, everyone, and have a good night. Yes. Happy holidays. Be safe. Happy holidays. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.